Hi everyone, you see everyone showing up. Let me get my coffee. Alright. Good morning, welcome. My name is Kim. I teach upholstery workshops. I used to run my own fab shop where I designed and made my own furniture and did furniture restoration. But I closed my business a couple years ago because I couldn't sustain with the demand. So what I mean by that is it was just me and my husband wearing all the hats of our business. We couldn't hire anybody because nobody knew how to do what it is that I did. So uh, we couldn't, we were stuck. We were growing quickly, but we couldn't take on all of the work by ourselves. So we got burned out and we had to close. One of the missions I decided to keep after I closed my business was to teach as many people how to do upholstery as possible. So that maybe one day I would be able to hire a few people and maybe pick up my business again. So I was teaching upholstery already while I was running my shop, but not as intensely as I have been in the past couple of years. Uh, almost two years ago, I moved out here to the Ann Arbor, Michigan area, and I found a local makerspace, which if you're not familiar with makerspaces, it's basically like having a gym membership, but for tools, which is really, really cool. This particular space is 14,000 square feet. It's got a full wood shop, a full metal shop, a jewelry studio, a textile studio, electronics studio. They have software classes. You can basically come and use all of that stuff as often as you like, so long as you're a member. And you don't have to pay a monthly fee. You can do day passes or you can do like a punch card where you can get credits. But basically, it's a space available to the general public so that you can come here and make stuff. A lot of people that come here and have memberships here are small businesses. They either produce their items that they sell here using the cool tools that they have, or they um, make prototypes for the stuff that they have. So this is a really good place for small business to grow because the overhead is so low. I think top tier membership at this particular maker space is like just over 200 bucks a month and that's keys to the shop. So you can come and go as you please. And I think that that's fairly similar with other maker spaces. So I found it uh, an incredible opportunity to come to this maker space and not just get a membership and use the tools to make cool stuff, but also to be able to teach classes here. So I can reserve a classroom space and I can teach my upholstery classes here. So I started teaching in-person workshops here a few days a week, and now I'm up to four days a week for in-person workshops and two days a week for live virtual upholstery workshops. In the about 18 months that I've been teaching out of this space, I've taught more than 300 people how to do upholstery. 60% of them continue to come back to work on more projects. And that is an exciting figure because there is a very high demand for upholstery and a very low supply of skilled tradespeople. And I do promise you, even if you've never done this before, this is something that you can learn and this is something that you can apply to things to make a little bit of extra money or to build a whole entire business out of, depending on the effort and energy you want to put into it. Some people, though, just want to learn to do this as a hobby. I can see uh, you guys are putting comments and stuff in the questions and I will answer them, but I can't see close enough to where I'm at, so I'm going to take breaks in between and go back and read the questions. Today we're going to go over, because we have um, a lot of people just starting virtual upholstery workshops with me. My virtual upholstery workshops are live with me over Zoom. They're not pre-recorded tutorials, so they're they're built for people who have a project that they want to work on that they don't necessarily know where to get started or they don't know where to stop or they need advice on specific skills. My upholstery workshops are so that you can bring your own project in at any stage, at any phase, starting with any class. It's not curriculum based so you can come in and go at any time and then I will walk you through step by step how to complete your project. So this has been working out very well with my in-person workshops. I teach four a week now on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So if you wanted to travel for an upholstery weekend, you can come out this way. You can take all four of those classes for 225 bucks. Uh, but I also do virtual classes. So if you can't make it out this way, you can sign up for my virtual workshops and those are via Zoom. What you do is you bring your project to the Zoom. Uh, you show me exactly what it is and what you're hoping to do with it. And I will walk you through step by step how to start it, how to strip it down, how to repair it if you need to, how to apply all the materials, how to measure and cut for fabric, 
all of the stuff you need to know how to do it. Some people bring a project because they have a specific skill they want to learn, like deep button tufting or how to tie springs, but some people are coming through just to start. And we get all kinds of people in these classes from people who just want to do this personally for themselves to transform a chair to make it look nice for their family when they visit, or people who want to do this professionally. Whichever level of experience you're hoping to get out of it, the virtual upholstery workshops are perfect for that because they'll learn at your own pace. So you can come and go as you please and you can take as many classes as you like. I also have a support group on Facebook called the Loco Upholstery Club and that's for students who maybe are working on stuff from home and they get stuck. They can go into that group, make a post, tag me in it, and I'll answer your questions. I'm not the only professional in that group. We have professionals who have been doing this for 50 plus years in that group and they're all happy to answer questions too. So it's a really great support group if you're learning and you found that you've maybe been shunned from the professional community and they don't like answering your questions. This group is people who are all supportive of your learning and growth. This group is full of people who all want to do the same thing I want to do, which is train more skilled tradespeople in this field whether you want to do it professionally or not. The, the trade is dying because it hasn't been properly passed down through generations, so we're trying to keep it going because it's in such high demand. So in lieu of that, the people who are starting um, the virtual workshops, typically they don't know what to have ready on hand when they when they start a workshop. So I've laid out kind of all of these tools in order of like most basic to like super fun cool stuff that you want to have but maybe you can't make sense on spending money on to go over with you guys to show you what you'll need to get started and then I'm going to show you how to apply those tools to this project that you see behind me which I have already finished upholstering this one chair. If you've been following along and if you haven't you can go to my YouTube and you can watch all these live replays uncut. I have been working on a peony dining set. It consists of six different chairs, two captain's chairs with look like accent chairs that can also be used in a living room space, and then four of these chairs that look like this. With the feature of all of this furniture being this beautiful floral fabric on the back of these chairs. So they're on the back of all six chairs. This fabric was designed by Nikki Quartermain of Studio Q, and you can find her designs over on Spoonflower.com. If you've not heard of Spoonflower.com before, it's a really great website where you can either go upload, upload your own designs or search through existing designs and have them custom printed on fabric, wallpaper, pillows, bags, like basically uh, home decor type stuff. So I went and I found this really cool design that matched the peony theme that I wanted to do and I had it custom printed and Spoonflower sent it to me and now I am applying it to all of these chairs. This is a high performance velvet fabric which I'm extremely happy with. It's actually way better than a lot of the velvets that I've been given with, from designers or anything. It's a very high quality velvet to print on. And what I was happiest most about is that uh, it is saturated fully through to the back. So when you bend it uh, and you see through the nap, it's not white on side because it is printed on white fabric. So I was really, really extremely happy with the quality of this product. And I already have plans to order more from a different designer very soon. So that's what we're gonna be working on today. But first I wanna go over the tools. I'm going to bring the camera a little bit closer and I want to read some of the questions you have already, which I can't see without my glasses. Good morning, Deb, welcome. Sandra, Evelyn, hello. Thank you so much for joining. I'm just going to go through to see if anybody has any questions before we get going too far. see any okay so let's cover tools first uh, the first question people ask me when they sign up for a, vir a virtual upholstery class is what do I need on the first day of class well that's gonna depend on what stage of project that you're on so if you haven't stripped your project down yet then you're going to want to take all of the material off of it first so you're going to need the base the most basic uh, tools to get started on that you do not need to invest in a whole bunch of fancy tools right away I tell my students when they're first practicing to invest 
invest as little money as possible while you're practicing because it can get very expensive very quickly in terms of wasting materials if you jump at it too soon. So I always tell people when they're first practicing, try to reuse any of the foam and materials that you can if it's just a practice chair and it's not for a client. Uh, and then try and go through the motions as much as you can. So treat that first chair or the first project not like it's dipped in gold because you may not be happy with the results after your first chair, but that it's a learning piece and you're learning everything on it and you don't, you just don't want to spend too much money on it. Okay, so first and foremost, uh, what I like to cover is like the most basic tools and most of these tools people have around the house uh, uh, that you can use to get started, that you don't have to spend any actual money on. So the most basic tools that you can get when you're starting an upholstery project is something to remove staples, scissors or a sharp knife, like a utility knife, to cut off materials, um, a hammer, uh, some little tacks and a needle and thread. Like that's the most basic thing that you need to get started. You can do a whole entire project with just those tools. That being said, the right tool for the job can make the job go faster, can make it more efficient, look more professional, and take the impact off of your body. Because not a lot of people know this, or maybe they do. Upholstery is extremely impactful on your body. You can get arthritis, you can get carpal tunnel, you can hurt your shoulders, you can hurt your back, you're on your feet all the time. So the most that you can do to take that impact off your body, you're gonna be saving time and money later on down the road and saving your body, and you won't be in so much pain. So some of the most basic tools I get to start with, uh, the first thing that I want you to do is go and get yourself a uh, lifetime supply of band-aids. I also have new skin on deck all the time. In case I cut myself, I can quickly seal it. So any sort of antiseptics or soaps you need to clean a cut, and band-aids, uh, a first aid kit, you're definitely gonna need it. I have. I have left a little bit of DNA on every single piece of furniture that's gone out my door because you cut yourself in the staple removal process, you can cut yourself in the application process, you're going to hurt yourself. So make sure that you're prepared with a first aid kit of everything you might need if you, if you plan on hurting yourself or even don't plan on hurting yourself. The other thing that you're going to need is a pair of scissors. So I usually have two different pairs of scissors on hand. This is uh, this was a great pair of scissors when I bought it, but it's been used a bunch and it has turned into my crappy pair of scissors. So this is just a pair of Fiskars. I think it was like 30 bucks uh, at Joanne Fabrics with a coupon. This has been worn down over time. I use these scissors to cut off like used fabric on the material, string, rope, burlap, things that are not fabric. Anything that's not fabric, I will use these scissors to cut. Having a good pair of scissors on hand to cut through the materials as you remove it is going to be super helpful. It's also a little bit safer than using a utility knife, but also to have a utility knife on hand. So I keep one of these uh, uh, razor blades on hand at all times because I like to remove all of my fabric with the razor blade first, and if I can, twist off the rows of staples to reduce the impact on my body. So this tool in and of itself can remove the material quicker from your furniture and it can also save you a lot of time and it makes you feel like you're doing it a lot faster even if you don't have the staples out yet it does make you feel like you're accomplishing more and then I have a pair of fabric scissors and these are used to cut fabric only and if you've ever had fabric scissors or cared about a pair of scissors enough to reserve it just for fabric, you'll know what I'm talking about. You don't want your fabric to fray and get all nasty when you cut it and when you use a dull pair of scissors that's exactly what happens and it can make your work look really bad. So always have a sharp pair of fabric scissors on hand. So the first steps to uh, starting your project are typically, typically to remove the staples, to remove the fabric, to remove the foam and batting and everything that goes underneath. So in order to be able to do that, you're gonna need a good staple puller. Now, you're not going to go to Home Depot and find a great staple puller. They just don't have a sharp enough tool there to make it easy to remove staples. They do have staple removers there, but I don't know what kind of staples that they're using them on because they're usually rounded and dull and for me at least it's very difficult to remove staples with them. I have all of these tools and supplies on my website by the way so if there is something that you need that you don't have you can go over to my website and you can order this. I um, have these third party shipped directly through my professional upholstery supply vendor that I use and you get a little bit of a discount plus it's free shipping for any order over $100. So you get a little bit of a wholesale discount on that and then you also 
also get free shipping when you order enough material. So the first thing you're gonna need is a staple puller. If you don't have a staple puller, a flathead screwdriver is gonna be enough. Uh, you may even want to try and sharpen it down so that it can get thinner because sometimes the most difficult part about removing staples is getting underneath a deeply embedded staple that's kind of embedded into the wood. You can destroy fabric, you can destroy wood by chiseling it all away. So using a flathead screwdriver can work for a lot of staples, but it might not work for all of them, and it could cause damage if you just rely on a flathead screwdriver the whole time. But if it's all you got, it's gonna do fine in a pinch. But you're not going to just want a flathead screwdriver. You're also going to want a pair of pliers or a, a one of those wrenches that squeeze together super tight because you're going to need to remove staples that break off and you're not gonna be able to do that with a staple remover. And sometimes staple removers will only lift the staple, they won't pull it out completely. And to get it out in one piece, having a pair of needle nose pliers is really going to be the best option for you. So I like to have these, uh, a flathead screwdriver if you don't have a staple remover, but I have these three staple removers that I use most often that I rely, I've relied on heavily on my career of more than 10 years of doing upholstery. So this stapler here is the cheapest of these options. This is a double rack staple remover, and as far as I know, you can only get it on Amazon. I've only ever been able to see it. It's about 26, it's between 26 and 30 bucks, I can't remember, um, and it is designed, let me see if I can get this close. Here we go. It is designed to be ambidextrous. All of these are, actually. So if you're left-handed, right-handed, this tool is gonna to be good for you. And if you see close, there's two little nubs on the side here. One here and one there. And those are the little bits that get up under the staple. On the side of each of these nubs is a little notch. And that actually is what you get the the flat part under the staple and tip it up, you rack it, because that's a double rack, and then that will snag the staple and you can pull it out much easier. I love this tool, it's extremely effective at removing staples, but it goes dull very fast, which means if this is your exclusive tool that you're using to remove staples, this is gonna go dull after your first piece probably, and it's gonna be difficult to use on another one. I like to reserve this staple remover for uh, removing staples next to show wood or in the channels of show wood because it's not as sharp as the other tools. It has just a little nub. You're not pushing or applying as much effort, so you're less likely to scratch or chip out your wood, and it can reach deep into those crevices to pull it out without damaging your frame. So I reserve the use of this for uh, projects exactly like this that have show wood where my staples go right up next to that decorative carving. That's what I reserve this for because it's really good at removing hard to reach staples. It'll remove all staples, but it's really good at removing those hard to reach staples without causing damage to your frame. So that's what I use this for. These two staple removers essentially work the same way, but they look a little bit different. And my students usually either favor one over the other. So these are both from C.S. Osborne, which is a very old company that uh, provides upholstery tools and supplies. So they're very reliable. Most upholsterers have tools from C.S. Osborne. This one is a 124, and this one is a 120. Both of these tools have very sharp tips on them. And those sharp tips allow you to dig into the wood right next to the staple when it's deeply embedded and then you can just press it out like this. Both of these tools are ambidextrous. Both of these tools have a design in them that allows you to leverage uh, the tool off of the frame to easily pull the staple up. So tools like these and the double rock staple stapler are removing a lot of the impact on your body. If you've ever removed staples, you find yourself ripping and tearing and pulling and trying to get everything off in a frenzy because it sucks and you want to get through it faster. So you really put a lot of energy into it, but it really does hurt your body when you do that. So buying tools that uh, release the impact on your body is going to make the job a lot faster 
much more pleasurable, which staple removal oil is not pleasurable, but it is going to make it easier on you and it's going to allow you to save money in the future. Now these tools I think are right around $50 a piece, uh, so they're twice as much as Double Rock, but I have had these same tools for over six years uh, teaching and now I, for the past two years I've been teaching a classroom full of six students four days a week. So these will last a really long time. You're not going to be burning through these like you would a Double Rock staple remover. Same goes for this one. This one looks a little bit different on the front. Still two very sharp, actually four very sharp points here that allow you to poke into the frame and dig next to the staple. And then that bend on the tip of that allows you to leverage off the frame and tip it up like this. And then you just twist it when the staple is caught in that little groove there. You twist it and it'll pull the staple out all the way. So this is a really good tool and the other one's a really good tool for catching that staple and twisting it and pulling it. Um, so those are my favorite staple removers. But if you don't have 50 bucks to spend on one of these uh, and you'll never have to buy another one again probably for a few years unless you're using it over and over and over again, um, then you can buy something at Home Depot. Uh, it's not gonna be as sharp, it's not gonna be as effective, it might cause more damage to your frame. You can use a flathead screwdriver and a pair of uh, needle nose pliers. But if you spend the money, I, th I think if you were to save up like two, three hundred dollars, you could get all the most basic tools that are actually the high-end tools of these and you could get started. But if you don't wanna spend any money, don't spend any money. Try and use things you have over, around the house. The main goal for the first step of your upholstery project is to strip all the material off. And that is what you want tools to be able to do. So we've gone over the different tools you need to strip the fabric down using a combination of scissors, a utility knife, and some staple removers. You'll be able to get all of that material off. Once you've got the material off, you sort of have to evaluate and like see what it is you're gonna need next. Now, the next step to uh, working on your project after you've removed all the material is to evaluate it to see if it needs any repairs. If the chair is shaky or wobbly or anything is loose, you might find yourself having to go in and tighten screws or re-glue or do things of that nature. So the next bit of tools that I'm gonna show you are all the kind of tools that you're going to need for that evaluation and repair process. So you're still gonna to wanna to keep your uh, staple remover, all of those tools on hand just in case. But most people, even in the stripping process, because sometimes you have to remove parts uh, in order to get access to the fabric to remove it, you're going to need a set of screwdrivers, a set of wrenches, and a set of Allen wrenches. Because most furniture is put together using uh, fasteners that need these tools to take it off. So most people have these around the house, but if you don't, Harbor Freight is a really good place to get these. Uh, even the dollar store has these types of tools. What I will say is the most commonly used screwdrivers that you're going to need are going to be a P2 and a P3 Phillips head and flat head screwdriver. Those are like of the bigger nature. Most furniture is made with larger fasteners, especially the old stuff, and it requires a larger screwdriver to get the fasteners out. If you use one that's too small, you're gonna find it stripping out the screw. So if you're using a screwdriver and it's slipping or bending the screw, or if you're having a difficult time removing it, your screwdriver is probably too small. It's like the most common mistake is the screwdrivers end up being too small. You don't need a drill, although a drill can make things faster, but a drill can also, in some cases with smaller frames like this, ruin it if you drill too deep. So having a set of screwdrivers on hand is important. You're also going to want to have a set of wrenches on hand. Now I will say that the most commonly used wrench that I use is a half inch wrench or sometimes a 12 millimeter, um, which that's what both of these are. They're, they're very close to the same size. One of them is just a slight little bit bigger. These are my most commonly used wrenches, but it helps to have smaller ones and bigger ones too. And if you go Christmas shopping right around Black Friday, Home Depot usually has a whole wrench set that has ratchets and everything for super cheap. So I would suggest getting something like that. But rummage sales have tools. I'm constantly looking at rummage sales for this type of stuff. These are the types of tools that you're gonna need to remove parts of your furniture. 
sometimes you need to take it apart to remove the fabric sometimes you need to take it apart to repair it so you're going to have to have that stuff on hand the other most common uh, fastener i see requires uh any size of allen wrench and i i don't know that there's a common size on here um that i see most often because i see them sometimes real small and sometimes real big so um you're going to want to have a set of Allen wrenches. And uh, the, I know, oh, Imperial, that's what it's called. You're gonna need a set of Imperial and you might also need a set of metric Allen wrenches because sometimes they're different and the shape on those just is a little bit different. So Imperial and metric standard Allen wrenches, you'll need to remove that. So we've gotten through removing the staples. We have taken the chair apart, uh, potentially removed or added or tightened any fasteners that we need. Sometimes your frame is going to be broken on the inside. When you're taking a virtual upholstery class, usually the first class is spent removing staples and any hardware or anything that you need to remove to do it. But if you've already done that part, like you have to start moving to the next step. So if you have repairs that need to be made, that needs to happen before we do any finishing. And you're gonna want to have wood glue on hand, potentially some kind of pull saw. And you're also going to need a set of clamps. Uh, clamps look super different. I like these ones because they have this like pump action that allows me to tighten. You will find that um, on some projects you're going to need clamps that are this big and sometimes a ratchet strap makes a good alternative for that. I use these clamps for most everything I need, uh, but some projects do require a different set of clamps. My husband will tell you that you can never have enough clamps. Um, so anytime like we have a holiday or birthday or something like that we will get each other clamps so that we have extras on hand and i've used every single one of them that we have we have a ton so uh, having a good set of clamps and a ratchet strap on hand for repairs and glue ups is going to be super important now i could go over all of the different types of repairs you could do right here but every piece of furniture is extremely unique so you never know what you're going to get until you see the inside so i don't like giving that advice to people before i've had a chance to look at their project so if you have repairs that need to be done coming to a virtual class is a great idea to understand what it is you're going to need to be able to fix it so we've got the staples removed, the material removed. We have the frame has been repaired and tightened up and everything looks great. The next step is going to be refinishing your wood or anything that you want to do to the frame before you get fabric on it. So you're going to make sure you're going to sand everything down if you need to. Denatured alcohol is a really great solution to use to clean uh, the outsides of wood if you're planning to paint it or restain it. Because on older furniture that has a lacquer-based finish, denatured alcohol by itself will remove that finish. You don't need to sand it. So you can just get like a, a harsh like 3M scrubby and some denatured alcohol and take all of that off. But before you do the upholstery, you're going to need to paint it. So your first class might be removing staples and evaluating and potentially repairing. Your second class is going to be building everything back up. So I, this is a finished upholstery piece right here behind me. This frame right here is the one we're gonna be working on today needs to be built back up. Now every piece of furniture looks different on the inside. So the materials that you need might be different than the materials that I need for this. But for a project that looks like this and other ones similar, you're going to notice a lot of patterns and different types of materials you need. For this specific chair, what I'm going to be using on this is what I would also use for like a wingback chair. So a lot of these materials are going to come up in most of the projects you use. So to get this one, to get the infrastructure complete on this one, what I'm going to have to use is first, I'm going to have to put jute webbing on the seat. This chair didn't have springs, so there's no need to tie springs on this, but I do need a suspension system in the seat. And in order to get that bouncy suspension system, I'm going to have to use jute webbing. If I just put a piece of wood on there, when you sit on it, it's gonna be very hard and flat. But if I use jute webbing when you sit on it, there's gonna be a little bit of a bounce to it. And this stuff is gonna last you 100 years. So it's a really good alternative to putting wood on it anyways, and it's much more comfortable. So the first step is going to be putting jute webbing on the seat here. And I have, I apply that using staples, and I'll go over how to do it because we're gonna be doing that today, and a stretcher. So jute webbing comes in 
so many different forms. This is like a hemp style jute webbing. It's got red stripes on it. You can also get a synthetic jute webbing that comes in like plastic straps that kind of look just like this, but they're made of like plastic. You can get elastic jute webbing. You can get uh, rubber jute webbing. You can get all different types of jute webbing depending on what kind of projects that you're using. I stick with this sander because it's uh, more cost efficient when I'm, going, when I'm burning through a lot of students and it lasts a really, really long time. So this is the kind of stuff that you see in furniture that you're pulling apart that's 100 years old. This will last a really long time. So I like to have jute webbing on hand. Now there are two different kinds of hemp jute webbing that you can use on your projects. One of them is this red stripe and another one is called black stripe or some people call it green stripe because the dye itself used to make the stripe can look green or black depending on what you use it. This is thicker and more tightly woven and the black stripe is thinner. It's still tightly woven but, it, but it's thinner. This is intended to put on the seats of your upholstery and the black stripe is intended to put on the seat backs because it doesn't carry as much weight as this does. This is the weight of a whole human person. This is just somebody leaning back against it so it doesn't need as strong of jute. That being said, I use this jute on the seats and the backs of all of my furniture. So you could, it costs just about the same. This is easiest for me because my students burn through it so fast. This is the type of jute webbing that you want for that. To apply the jute webbing, you're going to need to staple it. So this is where we start getting into how, to, how do we attach these materials to the frame? What tools do we need to attach these materials to the frame? So the first thing you need to attach the jute webbing to the frame is a good stapler. You can use a hand stapler, that's fine. It does take a lot of impact on your body. It really kind of is a lot of pressure to be able to push like that. And it also, the staples cost a lot more money than upholstery staples for an actual upholstery gun. So I use a pneumatic stapler and you can also use an electric stapler. I hear those work well too, but you can't adjust the pressure on an electric stapler. And there are going to be projects that have harder wood or fabric that you need to loosen the pressure up on so that you don't burn a hole through it. There, you're going to need to address, uh, adjust the pressure on your hose or on your air coming through your tool. And an electric stapler doesn't allow you to do that but a pneumatic stapler does. Now, I'm gonna show you a couple different pneumatic stapler options here, but you can get, go to Harbor Freight and you can get a pneumatic stapler for 20 bucks, but those are the staples that are actually gonna cost more money. The, I think that the staples that you get over there, you can get a thousand for like uh, $10 or something, but you can get a 22,000 pack of staples for less than 10 bucks for the right stapler to use for upholstery. So you're gonna be saving money in the long run when you invest in a good tool. My very first stapler was this Bia stapler, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know if it's Bia, B-E-A, or B-A. I don't know how to pronounce it. I've never heard it said out loud. But this was my first stapler that I got that wasn't a Harbor Freight stapler. So this is my first professional stapler, and this was $400. It's a long nose stapler. This has a real long nose on it, and uh, uh, it was a very expensive purchase, but I've never had to um, have it serviced or anything. I've had it for the better part of 10 years, and it works just as good today as it did the first day I got it, so it's well worth the investment to have it. When I started teaching in-person workshops, I needed enough staplers for everybody, and $400 a stapler is way too much money. So I found an equivalent on Amazon for less than $100. They have these in the long nose version and in the short nose version. This is, I can't pronounce that either. I think it's Meat or Mitt uh, brand stapler. It looks exactly like this stapler, built in exactly the same way. It's just a different color. Works exactly the same way. Now what I will say is that I get a lot more um, misfires with this particular stapler, which means sometimes the staple doesn't come out, but I found that all you have to do is oil it when that happens. So this just needs to be oiled more frequently than this, um, but it works just as good and it's less than 100 bucks. This is a great investment for your first stapler. What I will say is if you're going to invest in a pneumatic stapler, you're going to want to invest in a long nose first. There are going to be areas of your project that you're going to need the long nose staple, stapler for don't have a long nose stapler, then you're going to get stuck and you're not going to be able to move forward. So this 
can work for any stapling purposes, even the same ones a short nose stapler works for, but it's going to come in handy for those areas that you need a long nose to be able to reach. So I always suggest if you invest in a pneumatic stapler, invest in a long nose first. You can get the long nose variety in the $100 variety. So keep that in mind. So we've stapled the jute webbing to the frame but we also have to stretch the jute webbing across the frame. So if you're to the steps where you're applying jute webbing and stapling it down, you're gonna need the stapler, but you're also gonna need a stretcher. So I have two different kinds of stretchers here. This one is basically both of them. Both of them are a block of wood with pokey things in it. You can make this at home. If you have a brad nailer or even like a regular nailer, uh, like hammer and nails with teeny tiny brad nails, anything to nail anything pokey in, you can use a block of wood, nail some pokey things in it, and you have a stretcher. This just leverages the material off your frame and it pokes these little pokey things through the jute webbing so that when you bend it down, it stretches that material across the frame. This is, I think, less than 20 bucks at Joey Fabrics with a coupon. This one is about $60. Neither of them perform better than the other one. They're both gonna last a really long time. They both have the same kind of rubber covering the wood edge to help protect the finish on the frame. They both have the same type of pokey things. They're just shaped differently. Now, my preference, this one. <laughs> because the black wood is shorter to the frame and the handle makes it much easier for me to handle but they both work exactly the same way. I could use either one of them in a pinch and I wouldn't know the difference in quality as it stretched over the frame. So to get the jute webbing on, you're gonna need these. After you put, oh, if you don't have a stapler and you don't, um, and you don't plan on purchasing one, then a regular hammer and like tack nails will work. You are going to have to buy upholstery tack nails, which are not super expensive, but they're really tiny. You're not gonna want them to be real big like any hardware store nail because they're going to, drive giant holes into your frame and your frame can only hold so many staples or so many nails. So the more fasteners you put in it, the more damage it does to your frame. So I prefer staples over upholstery tacks because they leave smaller holes and they do less damage to the frame. If you're using upholstery tacks, then a regular tack hammer works. You can get these at Harbor Freight for just a couple of bucks. I have two different types of tack hammers. I have the metal one for nails and anything I need to nail that is metal like that. And I also have one with a silicone tip. Now this, I think is like a $75 uh, hammer, but I've only ever had to buy one in 10 years. And I believe the silicone tip is replaceable. You can just kind of screw it off. I need to replace mine because it's scratched up. I use this for decorative nail head tacks because the silicone tip won't leave a dent or scratch the finish on a decorative nail head tack because those are just plated or sometimes even painted on. So uh, something like this can cause damage to it when you're working on it. So I like to have one with a silicone tip and I like to have a metal one, both magnetic, which I find to be frustrating. I'm not a fan of that at all. After we put the jute webbing on, the next layer that goes on top of that is going to be the barrier fabric layer. The barrier fabric layer protects your foam or any batting that you're putting on top of that jute webbing from cutting through the gaps in that jute webbing over time. If you have springs in your seat or jute webbing in your seat, you want to cover up the springs, you want to cover up the jute webbing so that that foam can't find its way through the cracks. Springs will cut right through it like knives. Uh, jute webbing does the same thing, but it does it a little bit slower over time. So for that, you're going to want to bury your fabric. Barrier fabric, you can use any heavy duty upholstery fabric or canvas or duck cloth. You don't want to use something light that is going to disintegrate and disappear over time. But I use I use a synthetic burlap, and that's what this is. So this is sort of a plasticky material. It's kind of fuzzy on one side, fuzzier on the other side. Uh, that helps uh, foam and everything to grip to it when it's on the surface. I will use a barrier material like this or any scrap material I might have laying around that needs to get used to cover up the surface of the jute webbing or the springs to prevent the foam from cutting through over time. So after you've applied that, then you start applying all of your materials to it, which we'll get into that when we start applying these materials, but I just kind of wanted to go over the next tools in that phase as we go. So. We have to measure and cut for materials. So to be able to measure for materials, where's my ruler?
to be able to measure for materials, you're going to need a fabric tape. You're going to need a flexible tape because your furniture is rounded, it's not square, and a straight ruler is not going to be as effective as measuring it. You're going to need a fabric tape. But I also suggest suggest having some straight edge rulers around that are at least a yard long. These are 48 inches long. These are 48 long. So I have one straight edge ruler that I got first before I got a T-square. This is really great for measuring long distances and keeping your lines straight. But my favorite straight edge ruler is this T-square. And I got this at Home Depot. One, it makes my hair pop and I think you'll agree. But two, this T-square part on the edge of it helps keep your measurements square so that you're not cutting polygons when you need rectangles. This helps to keep your measurements square. Most effective on foam because foam is stiff and it doesn't move, but it also works really well for fabric. So if you had to get one or the other, I would suggest getting a T-square over just a yardstick because this is going to be the most helpful part about that tool. So. We have those to measure materials, but you also need tools to mark the materials. Uh, I am unprofessional in such a way that I love to use a Sharpie on my materials and sometimes the face of my materials. Don't do that. That's very unprofessional. But I like to have a couple different Sharpies on hand, one for my first mark and one for the second mark I need to make so I know which one to cut. And then I also have chalk on hand for people who would rather use chalk and not permanently mark their fabric, potentially ruining it. This is the smart choice. This particular chalk uh, liner is like a tube that you put dust chalk inside and it has a little rolly thing at the end here that will leave a line on your fabric. This is Taylor's chalk really good tailor's chalk. You'll have to actually sharpen the edges to get the chalk to work and write on it. Really cheap tailor's chalk is going to just, you won't have to sharpen as much, but it does crumble very fast. So really good tailor's chalk is kind of more dense and harder to break. Really cheap stuff will break easy, but it makes marks easier. So it's all, it's all up to you. I also like to have a pen and a pencil on hand because sometimes these are better tools for marking particularly when I'm using a seam puck. Uh, a Sharpie will not fit in this, and I can't get a piece of chalk to fit in this either, but this tool was designed for tools like pens and pencils or like a chalk pencil. And if you've never heard of a seam puck before, I'll show you, I'll give it a little close so you can see. Um, anybody who's ever done sewing, who's ever used a bobbin as a marker to get your seam allowance, that's basically essentially what this tool is. So this has different pieces that will come out and here I can pop it out at the half inch mark like this and I can use this tool with a pencil or a pen and stick it in there and trace around the shape of like a cushion or a dining room seat and it'll give me a half inch seam allowance outside of the edge of that frame so that I can account for my seam allowance very easily. This is really great for weird shapes that you can't just measure out with a ruler and it goes from a quarter inch all the way up to two inches wide. You can also just use a bobbin or a ruler. You don't need this. This is a $40 tool, but it is an incredible tool that has saved me a lot of time and it was a great investment. And you can get these, if you search seam puck on TikTok, you'll see it. Uh, but this is from Beals Upholstery. My friend Jeremy over there designed this, invented it, and had them 3D printed so you can order these directly from him. So that's what I use to like mark my fabric. Um, you're going to, the first materials that you measure and cut for are going to be the foam and batting. And to cut foam, some foam is thin enough where you can use scissors, but a lot of foam is not. And foam saws are about 600 bucks a pop, and they're very heavy and cumbersome on your hands, and most people don't have that. You do not need to buy a foam saw to cut through foam. I highly suggest you do not use a hot knife to melt the foam and cut it, because the fumes are noxious and they can give you cancer. But you can use a bread knife or an electric bread knife, which is what I use to cut through your foam material. Anything that's like two inches or bigger, this works with. Helps to have a silicone spray uh, to make it slip through easier, but it does cut pretty easy. I let my students also cut this with uh, glue on their foam sometimes, so I have glue stuck to mine, so they have to be cleaned fairly easily. The cheap ones can burn out fast if you use them a lot, but if you take care of them well, they won't. 
but essentially this serrated knife is perfect it's the perfect length and it's electric to cut through your phone very easily so i have this electric phone cutter that I, it's a black and decker it cost me 20 bucks you can find these for five dollars at the thrift store any old time because everybody buys them and nobody uses them so they all get donated so you can find these used fairly easily and they haven't really been used so uh, you don't have to have an electric bread knife though any serrated knife will work this actually comes off um, a serrated bread knife or even a steak knife if that's all you have will cut through foam really easily one thing to keep in mind though is that serrated knives are only sharp in one direction so they only cut in one direction in this case it's the push direction this only cuts when you're pushing because the blade the sharp part of the blade is on this side so if you use a serrated knife to cut your foam try to avoid doing this sign because you're going to chop it up find out which direction it cuts in and just push lift it out push lift it out and it's going to give you a nice clean cut that's the goal is to make your work look as clean as possible so i use scissors to cut foam i always use this electric bread knife but a serrated bread knife works really well too what else do we got uh i have one more tool well, actually i have a little bit more so you're also going to want to have some pins on hand i use pins to sort of attach fabric in places before i put staples on it or sometimes to pin my fabric together if i'm sewing it straight pins are necessary but you're also going to need some curved needles because there is some hand stitching involved and a straight needle is not going to work well in upholstery these curved needles i have on my website i think it comes with five of them this tiny one is the one i use the most it's the sharpest and the easiest to use and i find these big ones just end up floating all over my shop and i don't use them a lot so if you can just find a bunch of these tiny ones uh you'll always lose them so make sure you have a ton on hand but also have a straight needle just in case you need a straight needle i have those and the other type of needle that you're potentially going to need is going to be a tufting needle these are a couple different lengths here i don't know if you can see them from there i have a shorter one and a longer one this is going to allow you to get string for your buttons through thick materials like the back of a couch or a thick piece of foam you're going to want these on hand and they have these on my website and i they also have them at joanne fabrics and sometimes uh, big box stores like Meyer or Walmart or Target will have stuff like these in like their home improvement sections. Um, another tool that you don't need to have but I like a lot is a regulator which is essentially just a real pokey thing <laughs> with a handle on it. A screwdriver can work as a regulator too but this is an essential tool that I use to put welting on, to tuck seams back, to put a foam back in stuff, to poke out corners. Like I use this tool for so many things. This is definitely something that you're gonna wanna have. What else do I got? Oh, so a couple of fun tools before we get through. You do not need these tools to do upholstery, uh, but they are nice to have. This is what I like to call a ka-chunk -ka chunk It's not a ka-chunk -ka chunk though. It's a, called a clinch it tool. And it has little brackets under here that you will put on the ring of your spring when it goes to the jute webbing and you pull this handle and it attaches the spring to the jute webbing. So this is a great tool alternative to sewing your springs to your jute webbing, which can easily be done, but this does it much faster and it takes less impact on your body. It is a $400 tool though and the little brackets are sold separate. Uh, and the last one, fun one that I'll show you. So this tool is a want. It's definitely not neat because you can make it with cardboard just as easily. But I got this because I thought it would work better than cardboard. It does work better than cardboard and it looks cool. So this is called a feather bazooka, which is a fun name. This is essentially just an aluminum tube with a little air tool attached to it and you connect your air hose to it and it will blow air through the tube this way into the pillow or whatever you're trying to stuff with down feathers and then you stick this end into the bag of feathers and the air blowing through here creates a suction on this end and will suck feathers through here and spit them out this end and put them in the pillow. 
this I think is like a $60 tool or it might be 125 bucks. I can't remember. It's been years since I bought it. I've only used it a couple times, but it's one of my favorite tools because uh, cleaning up down feathers is a fucking nightmare. So this is a really cool thing to help keep that as clean as you possibly can. Although I will say you're still gonna see feathers all over the place. Just a lot less of them. That is all I have for, oh, actually I have one more tool. If you can swing it, and I got, this isn't even mine, this belongs to Maker Works, but I have one too, it's just not here. Uh, steamer. Steamers can help plump up foam, they can help get uh, wrinkles out of fabric after you've already applied them to your piece. They can help make things look nice and clean and they can help shrink vinyl and leather. Having a steamer on hand is almost an essential tool. You don't need it for your first projects, but think about saving up to get one. I got mine for 12 bucks at a thrift store and it's like a heavy duty steamer. This is a light steamer and I bet you can buy this for 20 bucks online somewhere. This is a, it's called Joy, my little steamer go mini. And this is uh, essentially super useful for plumping up foam. If you're reusing foam, you can steam it and it'll plump it back up into the right space or stretching fabric over shrinking it or getting wrinkles out of it. It's a tool that I use every single day. So that's something that you're gonna need. But if you're just getting started and you're starting with your first virtual upholstery class, the only thing you need to get started is a pair of scissors, a pair of pliers, a staple remover, and potentially a razor blade. If you don't have a razor blade, this isn't gonna be fine. That's what you're gonna need to get everything off. So I'm gonna go back through and look at the comments. And if there's questions about the tools, I'll re-demonstrate anything that you guys need. I'm just going back up. I need a proper lesson in installing webbing. Well, you're gonna get one today, girl, because that's what we're actually getting ready to do next as soon as I answer these questions. Your tape measures both match, I love it. Yeah, they also all have like blue right around the edge where they go up under my hair too, which is fun. You'll know which one belongs to me. Good morning, everybody joining. If you're just joining for the first time, my name is Kim, I teach upholstery. Today, we're gonna be working on upholstering this chair right here to look like well, this chair right here. Uh, and that's the step we're getting at now. I just went over all the basic tools you'll need to get started doing upholstery. And I this live replay will be over on my YouTube channel later on this week. So you can go back on and read those tools. I do plan on creating some content with a video that I just made with you guys. So you'll probably see some of that come through too. Um, so I'm ready to start on this chair. And the next step to this chair behind me is to put jute webbing on it. So we're gonna move over to my work area so that we can get started on doing that. And I gotta move the furniture over here too. while my air compressor is airing up i'm just going to get stuff situated over here i don't want to try and tell you too much while the sound is on because it's difficult to hear me so just give a minute for that sound to go away and then we'll start attaching the jute webbing to this seat and i'm going to do an aerial view so you can see everything from the top
take advantage of the quiet while it's here. Okay, so now we're about to put jute webbing on this chair. We've gotten everything stripped down. I've repaired the frame. I've painted everything so the finish is complete. And now I gotta start putting all the materials back on. So the first step is putting jute webbing on the seat, which is gonna provide the suspension system. So when someone sits on it, it's a little squishy, a little bouncy. If I just put a piece of wood on it, it would be flat. And if someone were to like land hard on that, it actually does hurt your butt to go through that. So I want to put a suspension system in here of using jute webbing. Uh, this is a deep enough frame to put small springs in if I wanted to, it didn't come with springs. Uh, and so I'm not going to purchase the springs to put back in it because it was built and manufactured to use jute webbing. So that's what I'm gonna use on it. Typically, the number of straps that you put across your seat is commensurate with how many springs are gonna go in the seat because your springs set on the crosshairs where the jute webbing goes like this. But we're not putting springs in this. So what we want is to evenly distribute the straps across horizontally and vertically to uh, evenly distribute the weight across the seat when someone sits on it. So if I were to put all my straps on one side, this side is not evenly distributing the weight. It's taking on a ton of it and someone might fall through the chair. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. For how many strips we need, I can basically hold my straps up and see how many I can fit. Your straps do not need to be tight, close together. They can have gaps in between and they should have some gaps in between. Uh, but we do wanna try and get a good amount on there to get some good coverage. For me, I think that one, two, three uh, vertically and one, two, three horizontally is gonna be plenty. So that's what we're gonna work on. I'm gonna put this camera above the seat so that you can see everything from like my point of view. So give me just a second to get this up there. I need for this job. The only tools I need are jute webbing, a stretcher, a stapler, a cruddy pair of scissors to cut the jute, and then you're also going to need a staple remover and a pair of pliers just in case you make a mistake you're going to need to remove that. So the first thing I'm going to do is apply my first strap here in the middle. This is going to help me evenly distribute the straps across this way. So I start in the middle and then I'm going to work from the middle and come out. Because of the shape of this chair, it's narrower in the back and wider in the front. My jute straps, one's gonna go straight and the other two are gonna come this way, overlapping that. It's gonna leave even gaps in between each strap across the seat. All I need to do is evenly distribute the weight. You can measure and make sure you're doing this dead center, but you don't have to. You can eyeball it. It can be just about right. It doesn't have to look perfect because nobody's gonna see it, but it does have to perform well in that everything has to be pretty evenly spaced. <coughs> so you'll notice <coughs> this jute webbing is still attached to the roll. The reason for that is I know I'm going to need extra jute to stretch it over. So if I pre-cut that, I'm gonna be wasting however much jute down here I needed to stretch it. So I leave it attached to the roll until after I get it stapled down. Placement is going to be center back, and then I also wanna stretch it to center front. The first thing I'm gonna do is put a few staples across the surface in the back, and I usually use like four or five. I do this at a diagonal angle too, the diagonal staple covers more surface area and helps to hold in that weave so it doesn't stretch as much over time. So four staples is good there. I also want to fold this over and put another row of staples in it. This is gonna help extend the life of the jute webbing because over time this does stretch and the 
the weaving gets looser. So this is just going to help it last twice as long by folding it over so it doesn't get loose as fast. I also want to make sure that I folded it back further than the frame because I don't want this material sticking outside of the frame where you can see it because you'll be able to see it through your fabric and it'll look like a lump and that's not cute. So now I'm just gonna put another row of staples on top. And that is an acceptable amount of excess here. We can leave that. But if this were longer, we would wanna trim it off. Now I'm just gonna stretch this material to the front. If you do this with your hands, this isn't gonna get super tight. This actually pushes down pretty deep and it's only gonna get looser over time. So you do need a stretcher to stretch this across appropriately. And that's where this tool comes in. Like we said before, this tool is essentially just a block of wood with pokey things in it. I don't know if you can see the pokey things, right here. So this block of wood with pokey things in it is going to help us stretch this over the frame. I like to start this tool flush with the frame here just on the outside of it and then I pull my strap right over top and just until it pokes a little bit through where those pokey things are. It's just gripping onto it. It's, you don't have to pull it through all the way because it's going to do it on its own. What I want to do is make sure that I'm stretching this directly across in a straight line. If I don't do it in a straight line, when I go to stretch it, you'll see that it stays loose. Oh, I got to verify. Okay. Sorry, I had to verify. So if I don't, if I pull to the side, I'm not straight across, there's an area of this that is never gonna straighten out. So you do wanna make sure that it's nice and straight across. At this stage, if you can't get it straight across in the middle, then you probably have to remove staples and straighten something out back here. But I have this nice and straight, and I have it stretched over my stretcher, and now I can actually push down on my stretcher, and it stretches it across the surface. You'll see these pokey things coming through here a little bit more, and this is getting really tight. And you can just keep pushing down on that until it's flat here on the surface, because that's where I'm gonna staple it. But you also don't wanna hear the frame crack. You shouldn't hear, that's too tight. You want it to be tight like a drum, but not so tight that it cracks your frame, because then your frame is just gonna splinter apart and explode when somebody sits on it. So just a nice tautness, tight like a drum without crack in your frame. So now I'm going to put a row of staples here, again in a diagonal manner, and then I'm going to take my stretcher off, fold this here, you'll notice everything is still attached to the roll here, and then put another row to hold that down. Now I can cut this loose. I want to leave about like three quarters of an inch to an inch outside those staples to give it a lot of room to wiggle around in there. But now I can judge the rest of my straps based on the tightness of this strap. And this is tight like a drum. So I'm going to now put my two straps this way. I am unable to do this. I don't want to attach my strap to this part of my frame because this is just holding this piece to this piece and holding it near here. If I stretch this, it's gonna pull it out of there. It's only being held with staples. So this is not something that I want to staple my jute webbing to. I wanna staple it to the frame. Here, I can't go straight back and forth in an evenly spaced manner because there's a leg here, but I can overlap this in the back and bring it up closer to the front which is what I'm gonna do. This part of the leg rises above this, so I'm not going to put it over top of this, but I'm gonna just put it right inside that leg. And it's okay if these overlap in the back, that's fine. This is all getting covered with foam and fabric, so it's not gonna be so bulky that people see. And now I'm just gonna fold that down. But you will notice that this goes on an angle. I still have to pull it straight, but I've angled it in the back so that when I pull it straight, it pulls it right up here to the front. So I'm just gonna stretch this in the same exact way, putting the strap over the pokey things on my stretcher, and then slowly bending this down until the strap is flat on the surface of the frame. I want to flick it to make sure it sounds like the other one before I stretch it, and I also want to stretch it enough, but not to so far that I hear the frame cracking. Oh, I'm out of staples. Hold on. 
I'm only going to go over this because every student does it incorrectly the first time. But these type of staplers, these upholstery staplers, a lot of home staplers will load the staples under here so that it's loading like this. That is not how these staplers load. These staplers load in this channel in the front with the pokey end sticking out because it shoots it out this way. So that is a common mistake that people do that will break your machine if you don't catch it in time. So I've stretched this cross, this sounds the same, and now I can tip this up. Cut this off. So my next step is making my last vertical strap on this side using the same theory as the other side. We're gonna get a bit of an overlap here and we're bringing it all the way to the leg in the front, but not on top of it. Hold that back. And now the front here, I can put my stretcher on. The thing with the stretcher, the reason why I keep it flush like that is that is usually enough tension for me to pull. But if I needed this to be tighter, in some frames you will, you can just tip the stretcher up and it'll pull it tighter. If you need it to be looser, tip it down and it'll pull it looser. That's how you adjust the tautness of your strap as you're putting it on. to put 100 staples here. Four or five staples across the front is the perfect amount of staples. Don't put 100 staples here. It doesn't hold it down any better. All it does is put more holes in your frame. And there's a finite number of staples that your frame can hold. This is just our first layers. The next layers are come on with the foam and batting and all of that. So you do not have to put a million staples in. So the next step is weaving it in the horizontal direction. If you've ever weaved a placemat in kindergarten, this is as easy as that. I am going to start in the middle so that I can evenly space these across um, to make sure that it's evenly distributed. So I'm just trying to place it there to see what that looks like. That looks good. But before I start stapling it down, I want to weave it first. So I'm going to go under, over, recenter. I'm going to start with this side. this in and then come over to this side stretch it across and this starts to all become much stronger now when we start to add our horizontal lines straps to put in and then I'll answer all your guys' questions. So if you have questions about this, what I'm doing or anything else, go ahead and put them in the comments right now. If you're here and you're learning something for free and you like hanging out with me, the only thing I ask you to do in return is tap the screen as much as possible. When you tap the screen, you're engaging with the post, whenever I remind you to do it, just try and tap it for as long as possible, as much as possible. When that happens, a little meter shows up in the upper left hand corner that's a little heart and you can get it to race all the way to the end. When it gets to the end, it throws you a party. And when you do that, it drives my content through the For You page and allows people to find me so that they learn that I teach upholstery workshops. So you're learning here for free from me today, but I also teach in person workshops and virtual workshops that people can join and get my direct help with their projects. So now I've woven this through this way, but it's in the opposite direction of the one I just put through. A lot of times people will make the mistake of weaving it through the same exact way. I don't think it's going to cause you any problems if you get that far and you don't want to remove staples, but this is the proper way to do it. So I'm going to catch the first end in here. Fold over, and then stretch it all the way across the side. And then nip that off, and then I'm 
ready to put on my final horizontal strap in the back before we put our barrier fabric on top to get this surface ready for foam. So opposite of this one in the middle, I'm going to weave under, over, and under. And these are all kind of tightly closed together, but that's just because the frame is small. They do not have to look this tightly closed together in the end. If your seat looks different, they just have to be evenly spaced so that the weight is evenly distributed. footing with your stretcher so you might have to get creative about that too. ready for foam. Before I put foam on here, I want to cover this whole surface area with a barrier fabric. That's going to prevent the foam from cutting through any of these gaps. Even these tiny gaps, over time the foam will just fall through them. So I want to cover this with a barrier material. But first, I'm going to put my phone back down and I'm going to answer some questions. Okay, I can't see without my lookers. Abigail said, how did you get into this? Uh, I got into this by accident through my hobby. So I was laid off of my marketing uh, gig uh, that I had been working at for like 16 years. And so I was a stay-at-home mom with my youngest who was three at the time and I just started pulling trash out of the, or pulling furniture out of the trash, restoring it and posting it on Facebook. Now at the time there was no marketplace. So uh, there was no place to sell stuff on Facebook but I was posting it on my personal page and posting it in community groups and then people started to want to buy my stuff off of me. So first I was selling my own stuff, my own creations and very quickly within the first year I started taking out clients to do custom pieces. So I started in residential and uh, in the more affluent areas because those people can afford upholstery and then they started passing me around to their friends and before you know it we found our way into designers my husband's also a metal fabricator and a wood fabricator and so we combined all of our skills which made us a one-stop shop for upholstery woodworking and metalworking so we worked with a lot of designers contractors and architects in changing the landscape of the cities around us by providing services to redo seating in restaurants or fixtures and bars and things of that nature. We built a lot of furniture and fixtures custom, but we started by doing furniture restoration. Are you hiring? Uh, so I closed my business two years ago, and I closed my business two years ago because we were in such high demand and we worked such long hours for such a long time. We worked 15 hour days, seven days a week for six years straight uh, because we were the only ones who knew how to do it, what we did. I couldn't hire anyone because nobody knew how to do it. So I we ended up getting burnt out and leaving the industry because we just couldn't take it on on our own. But that's exactly why I started teaching upholstery so I could teach more people this skill because we have a high demand for upholstery services but a low supply of skilled tradespeople. So I dedicated all my time to teaching upholstery to as many people as I could so that maybe one day I could open up my shop again and start um, and start hiring people. So my goal, my dream goal, and I'm very close to this goal because we've been working on it, teaching people for the past couple of years, is to open up my own shop that's sort of like a tattoo shop, but for furniture, where you can pick your piece off the wall, pick your materials off the wall, choose your fabric, choose your artist, and then that artist will make something cool for you. I have, in the past 18 months, trained over 300 people how to do upholstery. I'm pretty excited about that. I have a couple dozen students who live locally who are capable of taking on clients 
clients and doing professional work. So I look very much forward to be able to employing people in the future. Uh, and I would love anybody's help. So what I do in my program, I don't only teach in-person workshops, but I teach virtual upholstery workshops where you're working with me directly. They're not pre-recorded. They're live on Zoom. But I have a sponsor student program here in my area. If you've been a student of mine, if you've completed a project that you started in my class, then you are available to be sponsored. And what that means is that clients who want upholstery done but don't want to pay full price or can't pay full price can pay for the cost of classes and materials and the student will get to take those classes for free and they will finish that project for them. It's been a very successful program in the past year. We finished uh, about a half a dozen projects for clients and student work that comes out looking like they've been doing it professionally for years. So that is free for my students but they only catch as they had to have completed a project that they started in my class. So my classes, the virtual classes and in-person classes are three hours long a class. It's 75 bucks a class and in that class you can bring your project to me at any stage at any level of completion and I'll walk you through from start to finish helping you directly on how to complete your project. I do that in person and I do that virtual. Both my virtual and in-person workshops are buy three get one free because you're likely going to need more than one class to finish a project. So that means you can come out to my in-person classes which are Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday and you can take a four day weekend worth of classes for $225 but you can do the same thing virtually. Four classes are going to be $225 bucks for you which is a lot less than you would pay to pay someone professionally to upholster your project and you get my hands on support through the entire project. So I will be telling you yes that's right or no that is wrong or answering any questions that you have along the way. I would love for you to be closer to me too or I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right but I have um, students who travel from all over the United States, I think of 20 different states now, people have traveled here to take my classes because there just are no formal education opportunities for upholstery in the United States. There's maybe uh, about a dozen of them. I'm not on that list of them because I taught myself upholstery. I'm considered a DIYer, but I've been doing it professionally for over a decade. And I'd love to show you how you can do it, not for just to make your own stuff look really cool, but it's a really great money to make, a way to make money on the side. This set, when I'm done with it, with the table and chairs and everything that goes with it, I'll be selling for $3,000. I per, I, well, the chairs I got for 40 bucks, it was like, like a six chair set and the table I got for free on the side of the road and the material costs are going to be a couple hundred dollars to go into it and I'll spend a couple of weeks putting it all together but all in all it's going to be a really great profit when it's all done. A lot of marketing goes into that to get people to see it and I go through that in my groups and on these lives when people ask questions about it. I'm happy to help you figure out how to get into this industry, stick with it, get better at it and potentially maybe take on clients of your own. Where are you located for your in-person classes? I am located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So my in-person classes are here at my local makerspace, MakerWorks. So this is a 14,000 square foot building that has a full wood shop, metal shop, jewelry studio, textile studio, 3D printers, laser cutters, anything you could potentially need to make stuff is here under this roof. And this space is available and open to the public to use anytime. It's kind of like having a gym membership, but for tools, which is really cool. So I pay a monthly membership for access to the space and I reserve a room here to teach my classes to do my lives on I mean I'm here like five six days a week and it's incredible because now I don't have to have my own brick and mortar to run my business out of I can pay a really low monthly fee I can work on my projects from here I don't have room to do this at home I don't have a garage or a workshop I do this all out of my local maker space it's a very very cool idea I'm going back up because I just started reading from the bottom and I want to make sure I answer any questions about the thing that I just did. Do you use staples or nails? I use staples. I use staples uh, because they're cheaper. They leave smaller, teeny, tinier holes in your frame so they do less damage and it's a much easier process, much faster. Nails are really good. A traditional upholsterer might use nails. They leave bigger holes in your frame, which means there's a finite number you can put in there. There's, if it's already had nail holes and stuff in it before, you might not be able to use a nail in it because it might not bite. Um, and it's the process of nailing them in is a physical process. So nailing a nail in, one nail is like dun, 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 dun. One staple is done. So you're saving time, which means you're saving money in the process if you use staples. And let's see, I don't know if I can translate, I can. For lining of chairs and furniture, 
Uh, I'm not sure the context of that question, but if you make it a longer sentence, I can answer it. Can you show us that stretcher tool? I sure can. I'll show you both that I have actually. So this is a stretcher tool that I'm using today. This is a CS Osborne part number 253. This is available on my website and it comes from uh, my professional upholstery supply vendor, Active Foam. So you can order this on my website. I give a slight discount to my students, plus you get all of your shipping free over $100. So this is a more costly one. I think this is about 60 bucks, I can't remember. But this stretcher, you can get for less than $20 at Joann Fabrics. These are both blocks of wood pokey things in them. So you can get a block of wood and make pokey things with it and you can use that as a stretcher. You don't have to buy the $70 tool. You can simplify it as much as possible. Where are you located? I'm located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Love the hair. Thank you so much. I love it too. It's mostly gray underneath and I am now struggling to decide whether or not I should go all gray. It's off brand but I do like some silver hair. I would love to learn how to do this and I would love to teach you how to do it. That's a, I'm here every Tuesday, uh, for the most part, almost every single Tuesday, doing live tutorials, going through the projects that I'm currently working on so that you guys can learn from them. But I do in-person classes four days a week, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So if you're not local, you can actually travel here for the weekend. I know a bunch of cool places to stay if you end up out here. But you can take a four-person in-person in upholstery workshop four day weekend in-person upholstery workshop for just $225. That being said, every year I do annual upholstery retreats, which means you get to come stay overnight with me. We party in the nighttime, we do upholstery in the daytime, and my friend Chef Anasa Allison Anastasio uh, chef prepares all of our meals for us. I have, I'm only doing one of those this year. I did three last year. I'm only doing one upholstery retreat this year where you can come stay with me and it's August 15th through the 19th. That upholstery ret retreat is 10 times more expensive to go to than it is to book a four day weekend and come hang out with me for the weekend. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday classes, if you book all four together, is gonna cost you 225 bucks. The upholstery retreat, it's all inclusive. It includes all of your food for the weekend, all of your upholstery supplies and materials that you might need. Uh, four nights stay at the Newton of Ypsilanti, which is a historic mansion in Ypsilanti, Michigan, just outside Ann Arbor where we are. And chef prepared meals all weekend, as long as special industry guest speakers. Last year, we had Sharon O'Connor of Vintique Upholstery. She's also on the show Money for Nothing uh, on the BBC where they fix up furniture and they have local artisans reimagine and repurpose it and then they sell it for a profit. She's one of the local upholsterers that works on that show. She was a guest speaker last year along with Madam of Making and we also had a fabric expert come. So we have special guest speakers that come, chef prepared meals, four nights stay, three full eight hour days of upholstery. Uh, you can get a lot out of it but it costs ten times more than just booking a regular weekend with me which I do every single weekend perpetually until the end of time. Can you show us the stretcher tool up close? Is this close? And then this one is from Joanne Fabrics. Super cheap. I have a lot of experience. Fantastic. I don't have a building to hire you for, but eventually Monday, one day I might have one. See what does it cost? Each class, each one of my three hour classes is $75. Uh, you have three hours and you're in a class with up to six other people. My in person workshops are bring a friend free too, so you can bring a friend to help you and help you split the cost. Um, but you are sharing space with six other people while everyone's working on their projects. The cool part is everyone is bringing something unique to the table. So where you might be coming to learn a wrap and stable project, your friend next to you might be tying springs. So you'll be learning both of those things in your class and I find that my students really love seeing other projects in process. That is awesome, keep the trade going. Hard to find craftsmen in this throwaway world, it absolutely is. 
I'd love to live closer to you. I would love that too. But I do get a lot of people who travel um, out here to see me here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I teach my classes and I run my business out of my local maker space. I don't have a warehouse of my own or a cool band shop. I just work out of my local maker space and I reserve space to teach my classes, to do my lives. I live in the southern states. One thing I am trying to do is visit other states this spring and summer and teach my weekend workshops in other states. So if you have a makerspace or a venue near you that might be interested in hosting me, send them my way. If I end up coming out there to teach a weekend workshop, you'll get to attend that class for free. Uh, where are you at? Another, uh, another where are you at question. I'm located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. What do you do when you break off a staple and you can't pull out the broken piece? You hammer it down with a tack hammer, which I don't have near me right now, but you can use a hammer to hammer any broken pieces down. How long did it take you to learn? Well, I learn every day and I've been doing this for over 10 years. So you never stop learning. And I will say that a lot of my learning was paid training because I have people who saw what I was doing right away, who wanted me to do stuff for them, who were willing to pay me to do it, knowing that I was still in the learning process, knowing that I was practicing other projects. And that's it ranges from friends and family to designers who would pay me to do that stuff. So uh, I was, went from teaching myself upholstery to doing it professionally in just a couple of years. Like the first project that I did, there was a long gap between my first project and my next one because I wasn't like, woo, upholstery. I was like, I made my own chair, I had a kid, and a few years later I got back into it. But from when I got back into it and started really teaching myself how to do it and I'd never planned to start a business, within the first five months I was taking on clients. That's the first five months of teaching myself how to do it. And these clients knew that I'd only been doing it for five months and then I was still practicing and I still had a lot to learn and they were willing to let me practice on their stuff to do it. So I will say you can get paid training in this field. You can get paid to learn while you do this. When do you hold classes? I live in Ohio and would love to make it a week vacation. Let me know. I hold classes every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And my schedule is currently up through April and I'm about to add May and June and July as well. So you can sign up for classes uh, directly through my website and the link is in my bio. I love watching. I just dropped a fortune and having five chairs reupholstered. I love the process. Yeah, the upholstery is not cheap in this because there's a lot of manual labor involved and the materials themselves have gone up over 400% since COVID. So the, the skill in and of itself is not cheap. And if you find yourself doing upholstery, don't price yourself cheap because people are willing to pay you real money to do that. I have chairs and a couch of my grandmother's that I would love to redo. And that is something that is perfect for my virtual upholstery workshops. I do not do pre-recorded tutorials, although I do take all these lives raw and I put them on my YouTube page. So you can always go back through a project that I've been working on and watch the whole live replay on YouTube. Um, so my virtual upholstery classes are not pre-recorded. They're live on Zoom. So you're at home with your project and I am helping walk you through step by step to completing it. They're each three hours long and they cost $75. And they're buy three, get one free. So if you think you're gonna need more than one class to work on a project, it's a good idea to get all four of them at once because you get to save 75 bucks. My great grandmother's rocking chair needs repulsoring so bad, but I'm too scared to touch it. A good idea might to practice on something you find in the trash. There's a lot of furniture that you can find in the trash. Uh, pulling something out of there and practicing on that before you touch something that might be a sentimental value is always a safe bet. Uh, another are where are you located? I am located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, Amba says, your hair is amazing. Thank you so much. I love it too. It's my favorite thing about me. Let's see. Can you provide the fabric? Or before register, can we buy the fabrics from you? So I don't provide fabric, but I do carry the rest of your materials on hand available for purchase. I don't carry fabrics for you to purchase because my tastes are way different than most people's tastes and you're gonna end up something that Lisa Frank might like. But there are fabric stores near me. There's this really cool one that's actually about 40 miles east. It's in the Metro Detroit area called Discount Fabric Outlet. And they get designer discontinued fabrics and they sell them for $7.99 a yard. That's where I send all my students because that's a really cheap 
like amount of money to get a upholstery fabric for it. Decent upholstery fabric that you might use on a professional project is going to start at like 50, 60 bucks a yard. So getting a really good high quality upholstery fabric for eight bucks a yard is really awesome because you're working with the right materials right off the bat and you're not investing a ton of money into it. So you can find discount fabric stores everywhere. Amy says, I'm coming to take a class. I can't wait to see you, Amy. Could you help to know what fabrics and how much I need to buy for the material from you? Yes, I can. I'll help with that question right now and then we'll get back into uh, measuring for this because that's the next step that we have to do. So when you're measuring for upholstery fabric, you're basically measuring the panels that you need for your piece. Let me get the other chair that I have so I can demonstrate this way. So every piece of furniture is completely different, every single one. So you're gonna to wanna to measure every single piece of furniture that you do, don't ever assume that you know what it is. What I will say is most upholstery fabric comes on a bolt that's about 54 inches wide. When you're just learning, I want you to assume that you cannot get more than one panel of fabric from the width of that. You are not going to be taking the time to do the math and you are going to need that extra bit of fabric in case you make a mistake. So when I'm telling my students how to measure for the first time, I am telling them to not try to do the math of how many panels you can fit in the width of the fabric. Right now we're just going to measure the lengths of the panels. We're going to add all of those lengths up and then we're going to divide by 36 and that's going to tell us how many yards we need. I always round up to the nearest yard and I may even add additional yards to make sure I have enough to make a mistake if I need to. And if you're pattern matching, that's a whole other thing. I'll go into that in a second to tell you how much fabric you need for pattern matching. So this chair here, I have already pre-cut and measured materials for but I'm going to show you how to measure for it on this chair here that's already done. So this chair has three panels of fabric. The first panel is on the front, the second panel is on the seat, and the third panel is on the back right here. So I need to measure those panels so that I know how much material I'm going to need to reupholster this chair. That being said, I also have the back panel as a different piece of fabric. So for me, I need to know how many yards do I need for the back and how many yards do I need for the front. But all in total, I'll tell you how many as if we were using one type of fabric. So for this particular chair, this is what I like to call a wrap and staple, or in the UK, they call it a whack and tack. I'm just wrapping and stapling into the areas designated for staples. This doesn't get wrapped around the chair. But if your material wraps around and staples to the back, you're going to want to consider that in your measurements. So with this, I'm going to pretend that this all wraps around the outside, that it's full coverage. So I'm going to take my ruler, and I need at least two inches of material to hold with my hands. Now, you don't wanna measure for your material and only measure exactly how much you need to get it to staple there because you still need extra material to hold onto to stretch it across your frame. And if you don't account for that material, you're gonna come up short and you're not gonna be able to stretch it properly. So I add two inches on each end of the fabric because that's how much material I need to be able to hold onto. So I start my measurement at two inches and I start it to the back where it staples, which is gonna be about half inch down from the back or an inch. Adding more inches at this is not going to hurt you, it's only gonna help. And I'm gonna start from the center at the top because that's the longest part of my panel. It goes up in a hump at the top, which means it's taller in the middle here than it is on the sides. It's narrower on the sides. So I'm measuring the longest length of my panel from the top to the bottom where it goes in the back and then I add two inches to make sure I can hold on to it, which makes that panel 26 inches long. So now I have to measure for the seat, which I start in the back, holding that two inch mark where it has to staple. I'm doing it through the longest part in the center because it's longer in the center than it is on the sides. I'm measuring it down here, adding two inches, and I'm getting 26 inches for that too. So I want one of you to do the math in the comments here. 26 inches for the top panel, 26 inches for the seat, and now I'm gonna measure the back panel. Doing the same thing, if this were a wrap and stable chair, I would assume that the 
fabric in the back has to fold under itself to clean up the work so you don't see the staples. So starting at that two inch mark, I'm just going to wrap it around the front like I was, if I were gonna staple it across here and all the way down to the back where it needs to staple. And I've got 26 inches there too. So 26 plus 26 plus 26 is 78, yes. And so 78 divided by 36 is gonna be how many yards we need. I'm gonna let somebody do that math while I go through the questions. What was your rate at the beginning? Sorry if you already answered. I didn't answer. So your rate when you're doing upholstery is gonna be based on a number of things. The way that I charge, the way that I work my estimation process is I charge my hourly rate plus the cost of materials plus 20% for incidentals because there are always incidentals. Something is always gonna happen that makes you take more time or um, that is going to break or make you replace something. Always, 100% of the time, something always happens. So you need to account for incidentals. My hourly rate is based off of all of my living expenses, all of my business overhead for the month. Um, like all of that added up for the month divided by how many hours I how many hours I work in the month and that's going to give me my hourly rate but I also I also multiply that by two because I need to make a profit too I don't need to just get by I need to make a profit so my hourly rate is uh, all of the cost of all my living and business expenses times two like for the month divided by however many hours I work for the month and then uh, plus the cost of materials and then 20% for incidentals. So a set of chairs like this, one chair like this, uh, I might do for anywhere from like 375 to 475, depending on um, depending on the difficulty of the project. I charge $75 an hour, and that so my charge is $75 an hour plus cost of materials plus 20%. That's not true for everyone. Some people think that $75 is too high. Some people think it's too low. For me, I know it's too low. And the only reason why I charge $75 an hour is because I don't have overhead expenses. I pay one monthly fee to access my maker space and I can do my work out of there. If I had a business, a roof over my head, I might be charging two, $300 an hour because I have to keep up with those expenses. So that rate is gonna fluctuate and change and it needs to be, allowing you to make a profit off of the hard work that you put in there or you're going to get burnt out and you're not going to want to do it anymore. Do you have a video on what to sell a finished chair for? I don't because that is going to be determined on a lot of factors. But I do have a group called the Loco Upholstery Club on Facebook where you can ask questions there and I'm happy to answer. Do you teach how to remove the existing fabric? I do. You can bring your uh, piece to any one of my classes at any stage of the process, and I will show you how to start from there and work your way to the finish line. Where are you again? I'm in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, let's see, oh, 78 inches, and Jazz says two yards. So we're looking at needing two yards of fabric per chair and I will say that's consistent with what I have been putting on this chair. So for one of these chairs you would need two yards of fabric. I did however get four of these chairs with this green. I only had two yards of that green and I got the fronts of four of these chairs with that. When you start doing these projects, you understand why the prices are higher than you expect. You do, you put a lot of physical labor into these projects. It's a very stressful experience when you start to get a long list of clients. The way that I take clients now, because I closed my business a couple years ago, I've been teaching for a long time, now I have a handful of st students who I have to support the process that we're trying to get employed in this industry. So I have some backup support, so I started taking clients again. But I don't have a wait list. I only take one client at a time. I have a one in, one out philosophy. I take one client at a time because I'm more motivated to complete the project faster knowing that I'm going to get paid at the end of it. And I'm not pissing off anybody in line if that project gets backed up and behind, which a lot of times projects do. Then I've only got one client stressing me out and not a year long wait list full of clients stressing me out. When we closed our business, we closed our business, well, we stopped taking clients a year before we closed the doors of our business. And that's because we had a year long wait list of clients to finish. And we still 
never ended up finishing all those client projects before the end of the year. It was too stressful. So I encourage you, highly encourage you to do one in, one out projects. Do not have a wait list. I have a mailing list now. Like people can get estimates from me at any time. And I'll say, I don't have an opening right now, but as soon as I have an opening, I will send out a mailer to everyone on the list. The first person to give me a deposit is the one who gets the spot. And that has surprisingly enough created some exclusivity for me so people are clamoring to get on my list because there's no one in the area who supplies upholstery and because i work with my students on my projects my upholstery rates are much more affordable than local upholstery rates and they know they're doing something good by helping students to learn do you replace the cushion if it's in bad shape? I replace materials almost 100% of the time. And that's because I make my pro products for clients or for people to purchase as brand new projects. Um, so when someone gets this chair, it's like a brand new chair. It hasn't been used. Like nothing has been used on it except for the frame. So I replace everything all the time. When you're practicing, you don't have to replace the materials. And in fact, I would encourage you not to replace anything if you can avoid it because you want to save money so you can buy the good tools so that you can save money on the other processes when you start doing more furniture. Um, sometimes foam is in good enough shape that you can keep it. I keep a steamer on hand so that you can steam up the foam and replump it. But if this foam has any powdery substance on it in any way, it's, it's already deteriorating. Your upholstery project is only ever gonna look as good as the infrastructure underneath. And if the infrastructure underneath had been used for 50 years before you put new upholstery on it, it has a very limited amount of time of life left in it and your brand new upholstery is gonna fall apart at the same time. So it's best to replace materials, but when you're practicing, you don't have to stress out about it. All right, so the next step is to get a barrier material on this chair so that we can put foam on it. So I'm gonna get this chair out of the way. And we need to measure this seat for our barrier fabric, which I'm using a synthetic burlap. This fabric is just going to attach to the surface of the frame. It does not get wrapped around the chair. It's just covering up the jute so that the foam can't poke through. So I need to measure this chair at its widest width and its longest length through the center so I know what size rectangle or square to cut out to put on here. I also wanna make it a little bit bigger on the sides so that I can hold it with my hands. If you make it just the right size to fit on the top of the frame, you're gonna find it difficult to attach if you can't grip it with your hands to pull it and stretch it properly the way it needs to. So this, I need a piece that is 22 inches by 24 inches, and I might just do a 24 inch square so that I don't have to use my brain so hard when I get to the cutting table. So that's what we're gonna do next. We're going to go to the cutting table, we're gonna measure and cut the burlap, the synthetic burlap that has to go in the seat. Oh, that's what we got going on over here. So let me clear this space. My students are constantly trying to save materials, which I love them for. This, I might keep around, this little strip I might keep around to save because this also makes great barrier fabric for insides of arms. There are some small spaces that I can use this. Okay. So this is where that T-square comes into play. This is my favorite tool for measuring fabric. Fabric is loosey-goosey, it's not always straight, sometimes hard to get like good measurements from. So uh, I like to use the factory edge of the fabric as a guide. 
to creating nice straight lines so that I get pure rectangles or squares and not polygons. So I'm gonna show you how to do it. So we need a square that is 24 inches by 24 inches. I have, uh, this end right here is not square. If I line my square edge up to the factory edge here and bring everything over to the side, you can see that this line doesn't line up straight with the ruler. For the purposes of what it is I'm doing here, this doesn't need to be perfect, but I might want to consider drawing a straight line to work from a straight line for making my measurements when that measurement has to be precise. This one doesn't have to be precise because we're gonna cut off all the excess fabric, but that's something to keep in mind. I'm using this flat factory edge to keep my measurements square. So the first thing I'm gonna do is mark the 25 inch mark down on this side. And on this ruler, one side starts at one inch and one side starts at 48 inches. So you really need to pay attention what side you're using because you might find yourself putting your measurements in the wrong place. So 24 inches here. And then I'm just gonna move it down, I don't know, about 24 inches and mark 24 inches this way from that edge, which is going to give me a nice square 24 inch line this way when I connect these dots. And then I can align my square edge up to the side, but we know that this edge isn't square, so I'm not really gonna rely on it. But I can align my straight edge up with those two dots and make a line across there. Now that line only needs to be 24 inches long, so I'm going to remeasure 24 on this line, and then I'm gonna go across to that factory edge and measure 24 inches down that way, and then connect these two dots, and that's gonna give me a pretty good square. And the reason why I don't do it here is because if I accidentally tip my ruler in any direction here, even just a little bit, it'll compound that measurement and it won't be the same. That can turn my square into a polygon, and if I needed that to be exactly square, like a tailored fit cushion, then it's going to be crooked, and it'll make everything look crooked when it's finished. So, I'm going to rely on that factory edge, move this all the way down, align my T-square up with the top here, and mark 24 inches this way, and then I can connect these two dots. Now, if my measurements are right, when I connect these two dots, this square should line up, the flat head of this square should line up straight with that line, which it does. And then make that one. So now I have my 24 inch square. This is ready to cut out and go put on my chair. Just a little bit. Looks good. Okay, so now I have my burlap ready to put on the surface of my chair. This burlap has two different sides. And if you ask me what that means, I'm gonna be 100% honest, I have no idea. What I do know is that if I need to glue something to this fuzzy side, it can peel off easily. But if I glue it to this shinier side, it actually sticks down. So if you were to ask me why one side is fuzzy and one is not, I don't know. I'm self-taught and nobody has told me how. But I do know that this shiny side is easiest for me to glue my foam to. So that's what I do. So first I wanna sort of like spread this out nice and evenly. You'll notice it's bigger than it needs to be back here, which means we're gonna make some cuts to get around these legs. And it's bigger than it needs to be at all sides. We're gonna cut off the excess. Once you get good at measuring your materials, you don't have to use this much excess. But when I'm teaching my students how to do this, I make them use a little more than they need so that they have enough material to work with and manipulate it because they've never done this before. And they don't know how to get the most out of the least amount of material. So right now, we're just showing them the skills and walking them through. 
Someone said, is the feed working or is it just me? Are we having issues? Let me know. I don't know what I can do to fix it, but. Okay, so now I need to attach this to the surface. I'm gonna lock it down in two key areas before I do anything else so that I can make sure that this doesn't slip around and move on me. People tend to make this mistake to start stapling by starting on one side and working their way around till they get to the other with staples. And what happens is your material twists and shifts that way. And a lot of times it leaves it with wrinkles on the top. So I'm gonna show you how to lock the material down by evenly stretching it across the surface first, making your cuts, and then making the decision to put a bajillion staples in it. Okay, so first I'm gonna put a staple here in the front, just over top of where I've already put staples in the center. So first, I'm locking my material down front, center, here. And then I'm going to lock it down in the front, in the center, in the back. I do need to pull this taut, but I don't want to pull it so tight that it stretches. And the reason for that is when someone sits on this, it presses down. And if this isn't allowed to flex, it's going to tear away from these staples. That being said, this is not a very flexible material. And it's just on the surface here, so it's actually not going to get a lot of pull. You want it to be taut, but not tight like a drum. So I'm just going to drop one staple in the middle here. And then my next step is to drop a staple in the middle on this side and a staple in the middle on this side. So, so far we've got two staples. That's it. Don't put a bunch of staples in yet. Two staples. Remember, we hate removing staples, so we're not going to put them in unless we mean it. So one staple here, one staple here, and one in the middle here, and one in the middle here will help to stretch this across the surface evenly. Stretching from that staple to this staple, I'll put another one here. Now, my next staples, my next staples need to go in the corners here and in the corners in the back, but we gotta make some cuts here in the back before we can staple those corners. So in order to do that, and the cool thing is, is this uh, is how you apply material for every layer. This is how we're applying this fabric. This, this is what we're gonna think about when we're applying the seat fabric. This is uh, what we're gonna do when we apply the batting to it. So this is a great practice step in making cuts before you cut through your show material. So for now, I'm gonna use a Sharpie to indicate where I need to make my cuts. Uh, you don't have to use a Sharpie. I'm using it so that you can see it, but I use a Sharpie for everything. So my cut is actually gonna go from, this is doggy eared, flat folded, right along this leg. It's nice and tight up to that leg and then just folded right back at the leg. It's coming to the broad side. I don't wanna remove material here because if I needed this fabric to go back through here, it might need to wrap around and touch itself in the back. And if I remove this material, this is not going to wrap around and touch itself. Instead, I want to make a relief cut that allows me to fold the fabric along all of these sides to make it look nice and clean. Doesn't need to look clean for this stage because this is a barrier fabric, but it is going to look clean when you put your uh, final fabric on there. And this is just a practice step to that. So what I wanna do first, fold it up against that leg, draw a line from this doggy ear here to the middle of that leg. And then I put two fingers right next to the leg and make a dot on the other side. Now that two finger measurement is arbitrary. It doesn't have to be two fingers but I always have two fingers on me, so that's how I use it to make that measurement. So I put my fingers next to it, make a dot. That is going to tell me when, where to stop cutting and to start cutting towards the corners of this leg. This is called a Y cut, and you're gonna see why in just a second. My first line is gonna go from this dot just to the very corner of that leg here, and this one is gonna go from that dot just to the very corner of the leg on the other side. This looks like the letter Y. So I'm gonna cut straight up this middle and then veer off to those legs. When I cut to the legs, I'm gonna cut right up to the wood, but I wanna cut just inside the leg. When I go to do this cut, I'll make it closer so you guys can see. 
If I cut outside the leg, there's gonna be a gap in material where you can't see material right next to the leg, but I need it to come up close and fold up against it. So I need to bring these lines just inside the leg so I have a little bit of extra material here. So I take a nice sharp pair of fabric scissors and I cut right up that line. And as soon as I get to that dot that I made right after my two fingers, I'm going to veer off and cut one side of the Y till I touch the wood. And I'm gonna do the same thing to the other side until I touch the wood. And you'll notice this cut is just inside those corners of the legs. So now this little piece of material can get folded under and tucked down and that cleans up real nice around the frame. And this material can go over on that side and this material can go over on this side. Now what that looks like in the back, I'll show you. Because of where we made our cut just inside this leg, I'm left with a little lip of extra material here that can get folded under and up against that leg. So if this were my show fabric, that would be nice and clean. There would be no frayed edges. The same thing happens on the back here. So now all of this can lay flat and go around. If I needed some furniture, this fabric has to wrap around this leg and touch itself. Now, because I haven't removed any material, this fabric is long enough to wrap around the leg and overlap itself. So you don't have to add an extra piece of fabric there for coverage. This fabric does all of that by itself. So now I'm gonna get you closer to the other one. show you again on this leg exactly what we did. Okay, this is a little bit better of an angle. So I need this to stretch out all the way to that leg. I'm just folding it right up into that leg and folding this back right there. There should not be any loose fabric here. It should not be buckled here because when you go to make your cut, this all still has to pull back and it's going to buckle in front of that leg. So everything should be pulled nice and taut from corner to corner until this folds in front of the leg. And then we're gonna do our Y cut again. I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So first, straight line from the middle of the leg to this corner of the fabric. That's gonna allow this much width of fabric to cover that side and this much width to cover that side, which pretty much splits it in half. Two fingers in front of the leg for an arbitrary measurement to start my Y. And then this Y goes almost all the way to the corner of that leg, but just about a 16th of an inch inside and the same on the other corner of that leg. So that's what that Y cut looks like. Then I will come through with my nice sharp fabric scissors, cut straight up that middle line, stop at the dot where I made with my two fingers, and now I'm gonna start cutting for that Y. And I'm gonna stop right at the wood, but there's a gap from here to the edge of the wood so that this material when it comes over has a little bit of extra and can be folded under to clean it up around that leg. And now I'm going to cut that other one just inside that leg. So this material can go over that side and this little triangle from the Y can get, in this case, tucked into the frame. Now, if this starts to buckle up around this leg, if there's still wrinkles here, that just tells me that cut can get made a little bit longer to pull it straight. So now, to remind you, I've only used four staples. I have a staple in the middle here, and then I stretched it out and stapled it in the back. And then I stretched it, stapled it to the side, stretched it some more, stapled it here. Now I need a staple in the corner here, and a staple in the corner here, and a staple in the corners in the back everywhere. So that's what we do next. So, staple I can see all the looseness of the seat here I want to stretch out from the center this way I'm also stretching up 
and out this way to get rid of any excess material in those areas. I'm dropping a staple in that corner. Now diagonal from this corner so that I get a nice even stretch across the surface in my project, I'm going to put a staple in this corner. The step to clean looking upholstery is preventing yourself from putting staples in before, before you need them and first stretching the material across the surface evenly before you start loading it with staples. So you've got a staple here, staple here, now I wanna do the corner here and then the corner back here. So I'm stretching this out across the surface, drop a staple right here in the corner, come over here to the back and do the same thing. Work in my folds so we get look nice and clean around this leg, I'm getting rid of any wrinkles on the seat so that the tension is nice and tight. I'm putting the staple there. And now I have these corners in the back that I can do. I have one in the middle here, but I also need to put one here. So I'm stretching this material straight back, but I'm also stretching it out this way to sort of stretch it from this staple out and make it nice and tight. So staple here. And I'm doing the same thing on this side here. So now everything is stretched out evenly across the surface, nice and flat, no wrinkles, super taut, looking good. Now I can start dropping staples in because I'm not going to need to move it. I'm not going to need to remove any of these staples. Everything's on straight, nothing is twisted. So now I can go back through in the centers of these staples and start putting staples there. And you'll see I'm using my hand to pull this fabric down to stretch it. I need this material to hold on to. If it was cut here, I'd be trying to grip it like this. I have carpal tunnel. I can't grip that tiny. I need a big amount of material to do that. So now I can work my way around in a circle because my material is not going to move. All of my staples are going to go in diagonal because I cover more surface area there and it holds a weave better. And I'm just working my way from this all the way around my chair. And I'm pulling, I have a staple here and a staple here, so I'm pulling in the center here to get an even stretch between this staple and this staple and across the surface. take all of this and fold it back and I'm just gonna put a few more staples to hold it back this if I cut too close to the staples here this could fray out and then just fall off over time and I just want to save it from doing that so I'm just gonna double over I don't need to put as many staples in because I'm just kind of holding it over but I don't want it to look sloppy and I'm gonna do this all around the chair and I'm gonna remove the excess as I go. So I can leave about up to a half inch away from those staples, and I'm gonna trim the rest of that off. So now I can do the same thing for this side. I don't want to bulk up a lot of material there, so I cut that loose so that when I fold it over, it folds flat. so many rows of staples on here. I got two rows of staples for the jute webbing, two rows of staples for the burlap. Like this chair is going to get a ton of staples. But you can still minimize how many staples you have to put in. So I trim off all the excess as I go so that I don't create a mess of material when I go to put more material on it. Because you do start to get lazy as you get through this process and you're like, you know what, fuck it, I think that looks great. And then you just leave it. But if you're cutting the extra material off as you go it looks cleaner and makes the job easier and the final product is going to look better all right i don't want any of this to stand up so 
if it's sticking up, I need to lock it. Up. And then the last side. cut a square piece of foam and then I trimmed it to fit with my knife. This time I'm going to cut a pattern for the seat and then I'm going to take that pattern to my foam and cut it. So in order to do that, I need a piece of material. Typically I would use paper, but I don't have paper. synthetic burlap. Um, it's cheaper. And it's the only thing I have on hand right now, but a scrap piece of fabric or a piece of plotter paper or a bunch of printer paper taped together even will work for this. But I just want to cut off a piece that's big enough to cover the surface, which we know to be like 24 inches, which is actually more than I need for this purpose. I don't need to hold on to it. So I'm going to do like a 20 two inch square. I'm going to double check my measurements though. Before we get to making the pattern, I'm going to answer any questions that I see and then we'll start with the pattern. Let me just go back up. Okay. Ray says, Kim, you've gotten so good at the camera work. Thanks. I'm also trying to not talk to you guys when I'm not like doing something or <laughs> there's this noise happening because I like to use this as content after. Ocean says, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Potter, for saying awesome. Are you placing them on the outside edge for a reason? 
So I think you were talking about the staples here. Now, this is just a barrier layer of fabric. This goes underneath all the foam, batting, fabric, everything. This layer of fabric is just covering up the jute webbing so that the foam doesn't go through. So it only needs to be stapled to the surface. I do not want to wrap this material around and put it where all the other staples are going to go because I want to limit the amount of material that goes on the surface so that it continues to look clean. If I wrap this or if I wrap the jute webbing around here and then this and then the foam and then the batting and then the fabric, it's all gonna sandwich up in the front here and it's gonna look messy. So this material that's just a barrier only needs to go on the top of the frame. The only material that is gonna get stapled right next to this edge is gonna be the fabric, and that's to keep it looking nice and clean. What is the white fabric? So this is also a barrier fabric. This is synthetic burlap. It's exactly the same as this, it's just a different color. But this is cheaper than that. This is a little bit like thicker material and it's got more fuzzy on this side. So I use this so that I don't have to uh, spend too much money on making a pattern for my seat that I'm not gonna use anymore. So the next thing I'm gonna do is this, is, this is for pattern making. This is for making the pattern of my seat. My seat has a very unique shape. It's round in the back and it's curvy in the front and I wanna capture that on my foam. So I'm going to first place this on the surface of my seat like I did before. I'm going to, instead of staples, I'm gonna use pins to pin it into the fabric that's already there, but I do still wanna kind of get a bit of a stretch. So I'm pinning it in this direction so that when I stretch it this way, it doesn't pull the pin out. So I'm still stretching it out kind of taut across the surface, but not too much because it's not going to stretch when I put it on the foam. I just need it sort of spread out and pulled a little bit taut, but I don't want that material to stretch, which is why paper works better than fabric because paper doesn't stretch. So paper is a better material for this. I just don't have that on me. So I'm gonna lock it down in the center too, so it doesn't go anywhere. I have to make those cuts for the back, just like we did the Y cut. So I'm gonna show you guys how I do that without making marks. Once you've done enough Y cuts, you can successfully do a Y cut fairly easily once you understand uh, without making the marks that I did. So I cut straight up for the middle of the leg right here. My fabric is folded up against it. And then when I get about two finger widths away, I make a turn for the corner of the leg and then I come back through and make a turn for that corner so that this V is actually, I'm gonna cut it off because this is part of my pattern and I don't need it. This is pattern making, and that notch is gonna be cut out in the foam. And then this material can go to that side, and this material can go to that side. And this will get folded under, just for now. And then I wanna put a pin here in the back to hold that down. And then I'm gonna make my second cut around this leg. So straight for the center of the leg, about two finger widths away, I'm going to start the Y of my cut, going for the corners of the legs. I'm gonna cut this guy off, because I don't need it, but I will need it for my top fabric, so don't take that too literally. If it buckles in front of the leg, it just means your cut can go longer. Okay, you can see what I'm doing. If it buckles in front of the leg, it just means your cut can go longer. Don't continue going on the Y though. Keep going straight for the leg. So, stretch this out. Right now, I just want this fabric to hold still because I'm gonna take my scissors and I'm gonna cut this out. And I don't want, um, I don't want it to shift and move around. I want it to stay there. So sometimes I might cut a square foam and come through with my electric bread knife and just carve it to it. But I painted the surface and the last time I tried to do that, it scratched up my paint. So I'm not going to do that this time. I'm gonna make a pattern and we're gonna take it to the foam and cut it. Okay, so now I have this stretched all the way across nice and flat. So now I'm gonna take my scissors right along the edge of the frame, the top of the frame, not the bottom, and cut this fabric loose. That's gonna give me my pattern.
going slow so that I don't overcut because this has to be exactly this shape. did his job well. This piece will be symmetrical when it's done. If you fold it in half and it'll look exactly the same. If it's not symmetrical, we might go as far to force symmetry by creating a pattern from this pattern, but I don't know if I'm gonna have to do that yet, so I don't want to get too excited. So I am cutting this right alongside the leg here because in the foam, I will be taking that chunk out for the leg so that it can get around there. In the fabric, I fold it, but with the foam, I am taking the chunk completely out. Cutting everything to the frame in the back. material that is exactly the same shape of the foam that I need to cut out. So I'm going to unpit it. This is material I had lying around. You can use scrap fabric. Ideally you should use paper because paper doesn't stretch. But it has to be a strong enough paper that it also doesn't fall apart. But there, I promise there are household materials around that you can use for something like this. So now this is what my pattern looks like. If I fold it in half, should be the same on both sides. It is exactly symmetrical on both sides. Yay! I don't know what I would have done if it wasn't. So now we're going to take this over the cutting table and we're going to cut some foam. Ray says, I buy my paper on big rolls in the paint department. Yep, you can get like butcher paper, uh, any floor paper or whatever. That's a really good stuff to make um, patterns with. So let's go to the cutting table. So you can see behind me, my wall of upholstery materials. I always have upholstery materials on hand for my students to purchase when they come and to my classes to do their projects. But I also carry all these professional materials on my website. So if you're taking virtual workshops from me from home and you need professional upholstery supplies, I give you a bit of a wholesale discount on here. And you also get free shipping for every order over $100. So you can order all of your materials from me. Everything we went over today, is available on my website. So I need to find some two inch foam because that's what we're doing for our seats. And I'm going to put this pattern on it. When you do order foam for me, by the way, it comes this big. This is batting. This is cotton batting. This is foam. It comes in sheets that are 82 inches long. When I get close to there, you're gonna get some more perspective on the size of this. So if you do order materials like this for me, it is going to come huge. Uh, it actually will come small and then it'll get huge when you open it, but you do have to have a smart storage space for it. So, I have some two inch foam here. And for this step, I just need a Sharpie and the pattern that I just made to place right directly on the foam. Also, what I will say is that I'm going to trace this on this foam. We're going to rough cut it with a, an electric bread knife, but then we're going to take it back to the bandsaw to cut this very intricate 
special shape with the bandsaw because it will make it a much cleaner cut. I do want to double check my symmetry just on my notches here. Just so the notches are exactly the same size. Everything else looks good down here. There's just a little bit extra here. So the cool thing about this uh, synthetic burlap is the fuzzy ends of it grip to the foam, which also helps this to like stay put. Maybe that's why they're fuzzy. Um, I do want to leave enough on all sides that I can run it through the bandsaw because I don't want to end up cutting off too much with my electrical bread knife. So I'll spread this out so it's nice and straight. Use my Sharpie and I'm just tracing the very outside edge of this. Now, when I go to cut it, I'm going to cut that outside edge of that Sharpie line. And that's just going to give me a little bit of foam that goes around the sort of sharp edges of the wood on the frame. I don't want to put too much because it will look lumpy and bad, but I do need enough to cover that sharp edge so that sharp edge of the frame doesn't wear through my fabric over time. So this will be probably about an eighth of an inch bigger once I cut it. Take your time, don't muck up your fabric. Get those curvy edges on the front. And then I can take this off and I'm going to rough cut it out, which means I'm just going to cut lines just outside the lines that I have. And then we're going to take this back to the wood shop and we're going to cut it out on the bandsaw. If you don't have a foam saw or a bandsaw at home, an electric bread knife is perfect. This is a good tool uh, to use that stays nice and sharp. That'll cut through, I think, however long this is. That's how much thickness of foam it'll cut through. Unfortunately, it was not designed to cut foam, so the cord isn't long enough, and the trigger is on the wrong side. It's on the underneath. So I find it easy to cut this material by pulling it towards me. So I'm going to just square outside of this. I'm gonna pull it towards me. If you're using this knife or even a serrated knife as a tool to cut, one thing you wanna be sure of is keeping that blade straight up and down. If the blade tips in any way, it's gonna bevel your foam, which is why I kind of rough cut this out sloppily and then I take it to the bandsaw to make it look nice. About these bread knives is that the tips of them are not sharp they're rounded so you really can go all the way down to your cutting table but only if your table can't get ruined don't do that on your dining room table it's gonna definitely ruin it the thing is is it doesn't cut through all the way it leaves a little membrane on the other side but that's easy enough to tear out remember this is a rough cut for me this piece we're taking to the bandsaw to cut nice and neat. I do want to cut, just to make it easier, I want to cut a little bit of this excess off. Don't cut your foam like this because you can't see how straight your blade is. I'm rough cutting it, so I'm gonna go ahead and do it, but when you're cutting a clean cut with this knife, you want to make sure that it's flat down in front of you. Now you can even see 
me see. The variations on the side here where it digs in and goes out and that's from the blade being flexible. That'll, that can mess up your cut. For me, it's just a rough cut. I'm gonna put uh, this on the bandsaw and cut it out much cleaner. In order to be able to do that, I've gotta put you guys on a chest mount. I've gotta put you here so that you can see what I'm doing. And I'm probably not gonna talk a lot back there because it gets super loud. Well, give me just a second. <coughs> cool thing about working out of a maker space is you get to use all their tools without having to pay for all the tools or maintain all of the tools uh, like I did in my fab shop. So it's really cool to be able to come here and work on my projects and just use the tools whenever I want. So this is how I'm going to hold you guys up. If you're here and you're learning something for free from me today, all I ask is that when I remind you, which I don't do a ton, is that you tap the screen as much as possible, as violently and fast as possible, until that little heart shows up in the upper left-hand corner, and just keep tapping it until the heart gets to the end and it's gonna blow up and have a party for you. Fun for you, fun for me. When you guys do that, it helps to drive people to my page, which helps people to find my classes, which helps my business. It's, uh, I really appreciate when people give me gifts on here, but I get fractions of pennies of those gifts. When you guys are liking the content in here or sharing it or commenting inside of here, I'm getting engagement, not just on my TikTok platform, but on Instagram and Facebook and all the places that I exist on the internet because you guys are engaging in here and making my content relevant to people just like you. So it's a huge gift to me when you do that because that's how people discover me and that's how I run my business. So I'm going to put you guys here and I'm going to give you a little bit of tour of the shop first. This is my local maker space. I pay a monthly fee to access this space uh, and I pay the high end monthly fee which is all access to the space. It's $210 a month and I get keys to the shop. So I can come in here any time of day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is the conference room, which is their all purpose classroom. They do conferences in here. They host classes in here. They host events in here. This is a space that I lease out to teach my upholstery workshops. So I'm gonna take you, we'll start at the front and we'll work our way back. Every Tuesday we go through this too. So if you uh, look up Makerspace near me, you'll be able to see if you have similar resources. So this is the front area. This is where you tend to come in, where you can meet Randy and Lily and Poppy. This is a dog friendly facility and a lot of people bring their pets here yeah. or their dogs, not cats. Um, as long as they get along with everyone else. This is Nova. Nova or other staff members will be up here at the front to help you sign in. If you don't have a membership, she can help you with that. We have day passes, monthly passes, punch card passes where you can just come for a couple hours and work on your project. You don't have to pay an annual or monthly membership to access this space. You don't even need to have a membership to learn from the tools in the space because they have all kinds of classes which you can see listed on the calendar up here that you can take to learn how to use the tools. Through here, we have a jewelry studio, which we can go back and check through. Hi, how's it going? And then we have all of our 3D printers up along this wall. We have resin 3D printers and filament 3D printers. Through this area is our electronic studio where you can work on your electronics, every tool you would need for that. We even have a PCB circuit board cutter, which is you can design and cut your own circuit boards. I'm not into electronics, but I do think that that is pretty freaking cool. Around this corner, well, first I got to get some goggles because I need those in the wood shop. And you don't have to have your own goggles. You don't have to have your own tools to work here. They have all of that stuff here for you. So through this area, we have our heat presses. And we also have a large format vinyl cutter with materials on hand. So you can purchase materials here. You don't have to have them or bring them with you. We also have two really cool laser cutters that cut all different types of material. They'll teach you a class that shows you how to use them and how to design for them. You can cut through wood. You can engrave wood. You can cut directly through wood. You can make cool stuff like this. You can make cool stuff like this. Um, you can engrave glass. I think we have 
some of those up here. You can cut paper, you can cut fabric, you can cut metal, all different types of uses for this. And you can just come and use it whenever you want. So we have two laser cutters and then you'll see these classrooms or rooms to the side here. Maybe Brad's here, we can peek in on him. You hear Brad? Say hi to TikTok. Hey. <laughs> so Brad is a member here, but he also runs his business here. And this is one of the offices that uh, are available for lease. And so he's nailed this one down for years now, right? You've been here for a while. December 2020. 2020. So four years. You came here to learn how to make a cutting board for your wife, and now you run your own business yes. making glassware. Glassware. Let me see. We have a couple of things over here. So Brad's specialty is etched glass beautiful and what's your uh etsy you're on etsy yes uh, made by brad made by etsy. brad on etsy where you can get customized glass etched gifts glasses mirrors lots of different types of stuff and then he has his own laser cutter for that <laughs> and his own sandblaster and he keeps that in this space so these uh offices thanks brad are available for small businesses or people to rent to use to either work out of or store their stuff out of we have a lot of people who store things here this is our textiles area we've got industrial sewing machines regular sewing machines these are berninas we have sergers and we also have a cnc embroidery machine that you can use all of these things they have classes to teach you how to use before you get a membership down this hallway we have more member offices so these are businesses that pay for use for this space sometimes they leave the doors open so you can see what they're hiding inside but i don't see anything in here today oh right here this is one of the wood shops one of the members have so we come back through here and we have some storage space that you can rent out so you don't have to lug your stuff with you. Make our way back through the wood shop or metal shop. And back here we have our welding area. We've got all of our metal tools, saws, drill presses. We've got a cool CNC plasma cutter back here which is essentially just like a cricket vinyl cutter but for metal so you can see up here signs you can cut out a metal you design it on the computer send it to this machine and it's just like sending a file to print super easy to use the welding area you can access and use those tools whenever you want and we have cnc mills and lathes and manual mills and lathes back through this area we'll pass al Hi, Al. <laughs> Al is the expert here at Baker Works. There's a lot of experts, but he's the expert of the experts. We have a powder coating booth, sandblaster, powder coating oven, uh, uh, laminating table. So it's like vacuum suction table, so you can glue your laminate down. <clears throat> and then we're entering the wood shop. This is where we're going to be going and using these tools. This is arguably the most popular area of Maker Works because of the tools that exist here. This is my favorite tool, which is the CNC plasma or the CNC router. Uh, this is where I made my cicada table. I took a class on a Friday night, cut my first project on a Saturday morning. It was super easy. So this is the bandsaw. This is what we're going to use to cut my foam. And before we get started, we need to adjust the blade guide to the height of my material. So I'm gonna move this up just a little bit and I have to have enough clearance for my foam to glide under there. And then I wanna make sure that my, that my foam lays flat on this plate, just say with the same concept of running an electric blade through here, the blade needs to be straight up and down to make a straight cut. If I tip my foam like this, it's gonna cut it on a bevel and that's not gonna be the right shape. That being said, sometimes you're gonna to wanna to cut at an angle, in which case you can tip this plate at exactly the angle that you need using these functions down here. So I'm just going to start cutting this by pushing it through. I'm gonna turn the machine on down here. And then one thing you have to keep an eye on when you're using a bandsaw is when you cut foam, 
sometimes the pieces can get so thin that they can get sucked into that blade. And if they get started to get sucked into that blade, you gotta turn the machine off as soon as possible because that blade can snap and it can hit you in the face and you don't want that. So I am not gonna start with one cut around here. I'm gonna make several cuts to sort of get all of these out. I'm going to notch these out in the classroom because a bandsaw is not really a great tool for that kind of cut. But we'll turn it on. Watch your hands. And this really cuts through just like butter. Again, I don't have to own any of these tools. MakerWorks owns them all for me. I pay 200 bucks a month to access the space 24 hours a day. It's kind of like having my own shop, but I just share it with a bunch of other people. Again, you want to make sure that the foam is sitting nice and flat. And because the foam pushes through here so easily, you got to be very careful not to push your hand in front of the blade. Don't get cocky and don't go too fast. Put all these on the table so I don't have to bend over to pick them up. Lift that little corner off. So that is an example of the foam being sucked in by the blade. So we want to turn that off, wait for the blade to stop rubbing, and then grab that little piece and get it out of the way so it doesn't hurt you or somebody else. I don't like to go in one big circle because it gets shaky. My hands get shaky and it's less precise. Good. The notches I'm going to cut out inside the classroom. And from the wood shop, we can actually find our way right back in the classroom. Now, before we get too far, I also want to cut these notches out, which two inch foam scissors are borderline not helpful, but for this little bit of area, it's fine. But it gets real difficult to cut foam with scissors after two inches. We got it notched. Now we're gonna take it back to the chair. And I'm gonna flip you guys back around. All right, I'll take this guy off. Let's see if we get the fit. Perfect. So it comes out just a little bit of a lip everywhere, which is exactly what I wanted. It's about an eighth of an inch of a lip that it comes out. But my cutouts here work perfect. I'm going to glue that down before I go any further. 
this little bit of a lip is protecting this sharp edge of the wood. I'm going to go through and I am going to answer any questions you guys might have had while we did that. How do you decide how deep of foam to use? That's such a great question. Most seats, uh, most chairs like this or couches or seats, uh, average seat height is about 18 inches from the ground. So that's the first thing that you need to know. How high from the ground does this need to be? Now, a lot of antique furniture is much smaller because people used to be smaller. So it doesn't always apply to every piece of furniture you're using. Because if I took a smaller piece of furniture and tried to height it up to 18 inches, I may be adding three or four inches to that seat and it might feel like a bubble when I sit on it. It feels like it doesn't fit. So I have some pretty standard thicknesses that I use for certain things. A chair like this, I'm using a two inch foam, whereas a dining room seat might only be a one inch foam with some padding on it. Uh, couch seats tend to have anywhere from like four to eight, four, six, seven, sometimes eight inches of foam on them, depending on the sofa. Uh, I tend to go between four, five, and six inches on my sofas, but you can also measure the material that was on it previously and round up because keep in mind that material has been flattened and used over time. So if you measure material at two and a half inches, it was probably three inches. So I would round up to the three inches. Now, if you're building something custom or you're making something custom for someone, so dining room chairs are probably the biggest culprit and uh, banquette seating, things that go under dining room tables. You also have to consider how far the bottom of the table is from the floor because you're going to be sitting underneath it and you want to make sure your thighs fit under the table. So you don't want your seat height to be so high that your thighs are touching the table. So when I'm making something custom for clients, I ask them how tall is your seat from the, or how tall is your floor from the bottom of your table? How tall are your chairs currently now? And that gives me an idea. I'm not gonna have a measure of their thighs. I don't, that's a little bit too detailed information, but I can work with that information to figure out how much clearance they need to be able to make sure that they're sitting under their table properly. What else we got? Do you keep your own supplies there? I do. So I pay for storage space just like Brad does. Brad pays for that office to use for all of his tools and materials. I keep my tools here so I pay for storage space to line this up against the wall so I don't have to take it home. I also keep my foam and everything here. This classroom isn't used for a lot of stuff. Before I got here it was, it was barely being used at all. So I bring a lot of people through here so they don't mind me paying a little bit of extra so that I can use this space. Yeah, $210 a month is an incredible rate to access a space like this. And that's keys to the shop. I get to come here 24 hours a day. I can use any one of those tools so long as I'm properly trained on it. They have what they call checkout classes, which are their safety classes, which you take to use the, not, I wouldn't even say the majority of the tools, because not all the tools here can kill you. But a lot of the tools here can kill you. So they want to make sure that they're covering your safety issues and their liability by making sure you know how to use it. You're only required to take one class and they'll know by the end of the class if you're safe to use it until they let you loose on the tool. But the really cool thing is, is they have uh, standard operating procedures, SOP manuals, booklets next to every single tool in a three ring binder with step by step pictures. So if you forgot what you learned in your class, you can go through step by step and it explains how to use it. It's like it was why I was able to use the CNC router by myself for the very first time after my first two hour class because they had that manual available. Where is this located? This makerspace is called MakerWorks and it's located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. That was fun. I'm glad you had a good time. There's lots of fun tools here. What would you use to cut notches after a two inch? A bread knife? I could have used my bread knife. I used scissors because it was just faster. What is this place? Uh, this is MakerWorks. This is a makerspace, a local makerspace to me. There are makerspaces all over the United States. I think there's over a thousand makerspaces around the United States. Google makerspace near me and you'll pull up a few websites that have databases of makerspaces and you can check to see if there's one near you. Most maker spaces or hacker spaces are set up where you can pay a monthly or annual fee for access to the space, but they also offer classes and learning opportunities for you to learn how to make things or how to use tools properly. So I've got my phone on here and in order uh, for me to move forward before I go to my next step is I'm gonna glue this foam down so that it doesn't move anywhere. Oh. 
So to glue my foam down, I use a contact adhesive spray. I typically don't use this spray, but we ran out of my spray during class, so we had to go to Home Depot and get a contact adhesive spray. This um, is a 90 strength. This is the highest strength I think you can get of contact adhesive spray at like a hardware store. This is perfect for sticking foam to things or sticking batting to things, like glue work. It will not work to fuse foam together. It is not strong enough to fuse foam together. I get a spray adhesive that I use for this type of thing, but it's also strong enough to fuse two pieces of foam together. So in upholstery, we have a lot of cutoffs, a lot of waste, so we might keep big chunks of it around. So if we need to make one big piece, we can glue two smaller pieces to make one big piece. And it works exactly the same way as any other foam works. So there's no reason to not have something like this around to help you save foam, especially when you're learning. So this is a contact adhesive, which means it only sticks to itself. That means I have to spray the foam underside and the top of my barrier fabric <clears throat> in order for those to stick together. I don't need full coverage on this. I just want the foam to hold still so that it doesn't move while I'm upholstering it because it can slip around on top of it. So I'm just gonna kind of spray towards the center. This comes out like Spider-Man webs so you can see it. There's not a lot of overspray, so you can control it. I do, however, suggest you do it in a well-ventilated area. This shop has lots of ventilation. So I'm going to make sure that I first spray this surface. And I can control it, overspray, so I try to keep it away from my wood here so I don't have to clean that up later. But if you do get this glue on your wood or your finish, oil or acetone will take that off. And you're just gonna have to decide which one of those is less likely to destroy your finish. So uh, I use acetone on fabric a lot and I might use oil on the surface of my finish if it's been sealed so that I can get the acetone or so I can get the glue stuff off. I also have to spray this side. And the thing about contact adhesive is that once it does touch itself, it sticks pretty permanently. This is not that strong of a contact adhesive, so I could probably peel this off and move it if I wanted. Before you stick these two ends together, the, the, the spray has to be tacky, not wet. You don't want it to be wet because it won't stick to itself wet. So I like fan it like this so I can get it to dry faster. And then I very carefully start to place everything on. The one thing I want to make sure is that I get this back edge in place where the cutouts are before I stick it down because I'm not going to be able to scooch it back. So I'm going to prioritize the back first and get that pushed back as far as I can because there's a very limited amount of space to move around in. And then I'm slowly, first I'm going to feel the back to make sure it lines up with everything in the back. I'm very slowly going to start to lower it down in the front, but I also want to make sure that it is centered because there is a little bit of a lip everywhere and push back far enough before I push it down because then it's permanent, then it doesn't go anywhere. And that is looking good too. And it's a little bit more of an edge on this side than this side, so I'm going to try and Pick it back up real quick. Reconfigure that placement before I push it down. Ooh, the chair's falling off the table. And then once I got it on, I can push it all down. That's looking good to me. I've got a little bit of excess on this side. All right, so now everything is in place. If I wanted to put more glue on to like make sure it held, I could. Make sure it dries a little bit. That's holding much better. So that's looking good. That's what my seat looks like. And the next step is putting batting on the seat. But I actually want to get the foam part done for the back too. So the next part is actually going to be putting our next piece of material on the back of this chair. So this chair, let me bring the other one up that looks like it. This 
this chair is meant to look like this chair. So that's what we're going to start working on now is getting the fabric parts put on. The first piece of fabric that gets put on is this back panel here because this back panel actually attaches from the front. So we have to put this on before we put anything else on to make sure that that is going to look beautiful. Your finish is impeccable. Thank you so much. It's all like wipe on paint. I'm glad that you like that. Um, so this is the first step, is getting this piece of material on nice and clean. So I'm gonna take this down. I need to lay my chair down because I'm going to be stapling my material down like this and I'm gonna get you guys rise above it. And I have already cut these pieces out to sort of make it much faster. Now, a lot has to go on the back of this to make it strong enough for someone's back to go on it. But the first thing that I put on it is this fabric because it gets stapled to this area here. So first, I want to make sure that it is on in the right direction. I'm gonna use this chair as my guide. This flower is supposed to be at the top. So I'm going to flip it this way. I also want to know, hold on. Some of the material that I've cut for this chair is only exactly big enough to go on the chair. So I need to make sure that I'm spreading it out evenly everywhere and not too far in one direction or I'm not going to have enough materials to cover the whole piece. So in order to make sure that I spread it out consistently, I fold it in half and I mark the centers. I don't need to mark it with a pen or pencil, although you can. I mark the centers by clipping off the little corner after folding it and it turns itself into a little arrow like that there. So I mark the center at the top and the bottom so that I keep it centered from the top to the bottom of my chair so that I have even amount of fabric on each side to pull and stretch. Now this fabric, I only bought a few yards of and I'm stretching it out between six chairs. So I, I don't have a lot to work with, although this is much bigger than I need it. I want to prioritize closer to the top here. So I have some pretty clear indications of where the center is on this chair because I have decorative detail there. I don't have any indications on the bottom though. So I might wanna go as far as to measure across the bottom and mark it with a light mark in the center so that I know where center is. I'm gonna eyeball it because I've been doing it for a minute. But that's what you might want to do. I'm gonna tip this down so you guys can see. Hold on. Turn this around. I can tip it down so you guys can see on top. And then I'm gonna get my stapler so we can get started. Now this fabric is not the only material going on this seat. I wanna be very careful how I put the material on here because I don't want it to build up so thick that it comes out to the outside of this show edge of the wood. But this first bit of material has to go on nice and flat and tight. All of my staples are gonna be going on diagonal. That helps to cover more surface area of my fabric to hold it down. And it also helps to hold it down nice and flat, which keeps this area nice and clean for the rest of the material that I need to put on there, especially the trim part at the end. So I'm aligning my center up with the center here. I'm gonna make this a little bit longer than I need because I can trim and I will go around and trim everything off the side, but I'm just gonna line up the center and put my first staple in here. Now, if you're nervous that this is not where you want to put your fabric and you might have to move it, you can use what I like to call temporary staple. Instead of stapling flat down, you can tip your gun a little bit to one side and put a staple in and it'll leave a little gap under that staple so you can come back with a staple remover and remove it if you need to. Now I'm going to stretch from this staple all the way down to the bottom of the frame and put a staple in there. If I pull, so if I stretch this out, you can start to see it stretch forward. If I pull too far to the left, 
you'll start to see the shapes of that change. It starts to shear off in one direction. If I do it to the right, it does the same thing. I have more material here than I have there, and it won't look straight. It's very imperative that you're pulling straight out from that first staple that you put it in. And I, that's why I have that center mark, so I kind of have a roundabout idea of where to put that. And this is so much longer than I need it. I'm going to fold it in half just so I can see. But this is getting stretched out nice and taut, but not too tight from this staple to this staple on the bottom. And then I'm going to put another temporary staple in right there. So that's going to hold it good straight up and down. My next staples are going here on the sides so that I can stretch it out this way. This is helping me to stretch this material out evenly across the surface so that I don't get any wrinkles or shearing so it doesn't look bad as I go on. But before I do that, I want to look and see what it looks like to make sure I like the placement. I do. Before I start putting too many staples in. Right now, I have two staples in. I'm about to put two more. That's four staples. After I do the centers here, I'm going for this corner, then this corner, then this corner, then this corner. And that's stretching everything out evenly and straight before I put a million staples in here. So next step. Don't hold your staple gun under your chin like I am, by the way, you will. Shoot yourself with it. So I'm stretching across the surface nice and taut, and I'm looking for that edge where I gotta put my staple, which is right here. Hard to see once it starts to get covered with fabric, but you can feel the show edge of the wood with your hand. Another thing that you want to be careful of, which I just did, is that you don't want these staples to blow out the back. So if you're not careful about staple placement on the front on a chair like this, you're gonna see your staples blowing out the back because they're not going through. You can solve this by doing a couple different things. You can use a shorter staple, but that's not always great because it doesn't always bite and hold your fabric down. Or you can turn your stapler so that it doesn't uh, go off the edge. This has gotta get removed. There's my staple So I'm going to take this staple out, just a twisting motion. I don't want to damage my fabric. And then I'm going to put it back in, but this time my staple is going to have to be straighter. It doesn't really like going diagonal in this thin area. But I also don't want to put my staple too close to the show wood because then I'm not going to be able to align my trim there. So there's always a gap about this, the thickness of your nail head gun away from the show wood so that you can put your trim there later on. So I have this staple here. This looks like it went through right. And now I'm going to stretch this across this way. And this is where you start to see it tighten up on the surface. This looks great. If I pull it in the wrong direction this way, you're going to see wrinkles here. If I pull it in the wrong direction this way, you're going to see wrinkles here, a little bagginess here. So this is how you're kind of like pulling it out and you're pulling it out this way and this way at the same time. So you can see how it stretches. Finding where you put that staple, always looking just in case. And now we can see how that stretched out before we start putting a million staples into it. Always check your work as you go to make sure that that is stretching out across the surface nice. I can pull these corners to make sure that that's gonna look good. I can pull these corners to make sure that's gonna look good. I don't have any blowouts on the outside. Oh, actually that's not true. I have one down here. So I gotta replace that bottom staple. And then I can go back and fill that hole if it's obvious and like repaint it or refinish it after. So this is the staple I have to replace. Okay. So now I'm gonna do corner here and corner here. We're still just stretching it out evenly across the surface. I've got four staples in here right now, not 100. So I'm gonna take from, like really from the center is where I'm stretching it. I'm stretching it out 
but I'm also stretching it this way and that way so that it's nice and taut across the surface. And then I find my stable area with my stapler and I just drop it in. Here, I'm going to do the same thing from this corner. I'm pulling out straight this way and straight this way so that I don't have any slack between this staple in here or this staple in here or this staple in here. Everything is nice and stretched out. Looking good. And now I can do these corners. Once I have these two corners done, I can go around and I can put all the staples in until my heart is content because everything is locked in place in exactly the position that I need it to be for it to be permanent. There, last one in this corner down here. And it's already looking great. So now I can tip this up and you guys can already see the transformation of that being nice and taut and looking nice and clean on the back of that chair. So now it's safe to go through and put the rest of the staples on. And for that, I want to get you a little bit closer. If you guys are here and you're enjoying yourself and you're learning something, the only thing I ask is that you tap the screen as violently as possible for as long as you can, whenever I remind you, so that it builds up my likes and it sends my content through the For You page. That helps people to find what it is that I do and it helps them come to my upholstery classes and that is how I run my business. So you guys do a lot to support the upholstery industry by just hanging out here, learning from me and tapping the screen as much as you can. A little meter is gonna show up in the upper left hand corner here with a heart on it. Keep tapping until that heart reaches the end. It'll throw you a party. It's fun for you, it's fun for me. So I need to lay on the rest of my staples in this groove along this show wood, but I need to leave a gap next to this show wood so that I can put my trim. If I pull this staple back here, you can see there's a gap that is about the width of the head of my stapler there that I can come back and run through and put my trim in and it'll look nice and clean. But I need to finish putting all the staples in. Before I go from one end all the way to the other, I'm gonna to go to the centers of all the staples that I have and I'm gonna lock those down first. All of my staples are going in sort of on a diagonal like this, not straight up and down and not this way because it'll blow out the back, but almost on a slight diagonal to help hold that area flat. So I'm gonna grab from the middle between those staples and I can feel that show edge wood with the, the head of my gun. I'm just gonna drop a staple in there. I'm gonna come across from that, stretch this out the same way. Staple there. I'm gonna do all of that between all the centers of all of the staples. And I'm constantly lifting to make sure that I'm not accidentally stapling the show wood because I've done that a lot and everybody does. Here. People tend to get excited at this stage and just start dropping staples in. They, they feel very confident that they know where they're going with it and they just start dropping staples in without much thought to it. But you do end up, if you don't do it right, finding yourself coming back through and removing those staples later on. So my last little area is down here. Now I can start going around with all my staples. They all need to be kind of close to each other, within like a half inch of each other. And the whole time I'm like pulling the excess fabric back. Now it's a lot wider at the top here than it is at the bottom. The bottom is where I'm nervous that I'm blowing out. So I'm going to double check that. And I have blown out a couple of staples in the back right here. So I got to take those out, try again. Because I don't want to see that blow out. You gotta be real careful at this stage not to damage your fabric. One, two, I think these ones went down. So just this guy, I think. Okay. 
So those staples there need to be a little bit straighter. That's a little blow out. But they still can't go up to the show end of the wood. So these staples all get pretty close to each other, almost end for end. Oh my god, every single one of those blew out. I thought it was wider on the edge here. It is not. They didn't blow out, they just missed the whole side. So they didn't damage the wood, but they came out the other side in a way they are not supposed to. So I've got those lifted, but I don't want to damage the fabric with my staple remover, so I'm just going to come through and twist all of these out. My tools become magnetized after using them so much, so my staples are always sticking to my tools. And here, you'll see that it's left some pretty big holes, so I gotta try and make sure that I get those back onto the frame before I staple it down. So along these sides, I just need to remember I need to keep my staples straighter, but still away from that edge somehow so that I can get my trim in there. Now that I'm up to this wider area, I can start putting my staples diagonal. And again, I wanna put them diagonal because they hold this area down flat and they cover more surface area, so it's less likely to tear away. They do have staplers like this that are like automatic staplers. So like, they use those a lot in the mass production of because everyone does the same task over and over and over every day, so they can do it much faster than me. So I'm getting closer to the side here that I have to start straightening out my staple. But that's when the staple goes almost end for end. You'll notice I'm still stretching my material to get around the edge. God damn it. Some of those. Still got through. We get too cocky with these things. I don't think you're going to be able to see this. That was just barely through. So I can hammer those back. I need staples. So this is nice and tight, but this is not structural support. So this will still get like a strap of jute webbing on top of it to help make it stronger. So the next step is cutting all of this fabric loose. If you have a nice pair of sharp scissors, you might be able to use that, but I like to use a sharp utility. And I always begin with a brand new razor blade because you need a sharp razor blade to make this look nice. And you may see yourself replacing the blade more than once before this cut is over. But I think this fabric actually does not ruin my blade, so I think one blade is gonna be enough. The next thing I'm gonna do is come through and I'm gonna cut this right into this edge where the frame is. I think I may be able to show you better here. So I'm gonna go right along the edge of where the show wood is and cut this fabric to that edge. 
the show one helps be the guide for where, where I start, stop, and cut fabric because it's cutting it right into it. So I can go all the way around this piece like that. I don't want any of this material stacking up or going over the short show wood. I've got to clean it all back because I have to layer more materials here and trim to make it all look nice. So you want to clean up your work as soon as possible after getting everything on and do not wait until you get all the layers on to do this. Do it after every layer so that it looks nice and clean. When I'm done cutting this off, I'll go back and answer your guys' questions. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and leave those in the comments. Now this layer is going to get a bunch more staples in it. So there'll be more staples on top of this uh, with the other layers that get put up. Oh geez, and that, I slipped and I cut the surface of my wood. So I'll have to go back and fix the finish on that. That can happen. Some people like to do the finish after they've upholstered it. I'm a sloppy painter, so I don't like to do that. The trick to your piece looking beautiful is your work being clean. So this part is part to that process. Perfect. If your razor blade is not cutting that cleanly, your razor blade is dull. It should cut that cleanly. And I do have a staple too close to the show wood here. So I'm going to remove that and replace it. There's no gap here. And this is, I don't want to go crazy removing stuff right now because I can't pull that with my hands. So if I take too much of this off, I'm going to have to get another piece of material to replace it because I can't pull it with my hands. now we can make a pattern to cut the foam out for this and I'm going to use the same piece of material that we use to make the pattern for the seat so that I can reuse it so this is a material that we use to cut out the seat I'm just going to reuse it for the purposes of making this pattern so I'm just going to smooth this out. Paper is best. This is a concave chair. So I want to make sure when I'm making my pattern that I'm considering it that and that all of this material is leaning into that. For this, I'm going to mark it. I'm not just going to cut it like I did last time because it'll move around. And I can't really pin it to it because of the nature of the fabric that's in there. It's not self-healing. So I don't want to pin anything to it, but I can find the edge of the show wood with my marker. And sometimes I like to go through and just put the foam on, staple it into place and then cut off the excess. But the area to put staples in here is really thin and there's also a finite amount of staples that I can put in there. So the foam part I'm just going to be gluing on. So I've traced the material, thank God nothing bled through, and now I'm just going to come through here on the inside of that line and trim it away. And then we're going to put this on the foam that we're going to use for the back 
and cut out that pattern and then just glue it into place. This pattern's ready and we're ready to go to the cutting table and cut it out of foam. I'm gonna take you guys with me. I'm also gonna check and see if you have any questions before I get going on that. And I've got about a half hour left here today, you guys too, and then we'll finish the rest next week. Your instructions are very clear. Thank you, I appreciate that. I am self-taught upholsterer, so I wasn't taught all the big words and everything. And I feel like I teach people in the way that I learned, which is first recognizing the bits that I don't understand and explaining that first. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I work really hard on being understandable. How do you patch the spots where the staples blew out? Well, for me, luckily, it was enough to be able to pull that over and stretch a little bit so that you couldn't see that. But essentially, unless your fabric allows for it, like a basket weave fabric, you might be able to sew it closed, but I would replace that panel completely. I would not want a hole showing there, and there's nothing I can do to sew it to make it look good. Keeping it real, removing staples. Yeah, you're removing staples throughout the whole process of your project. Do not think that once you remove staples to get everything off that that's the end of staple removal. For me, I like to stretch all my materials out evenly first, which means a lot of uh, putting a staple in, taking a staple out, particularly on pieces that are curved and you really gotta stretch stuff to get it. What are the size of the staples? Well, the size of staples that I was using on that chair were 5 8 inch long and a half inch crown, and they're 22 gauge thickness, which is teeny, teeny, tiny gauge. Uh, if you're using thinner material, you might start off with a shorter staple, like a quarter inch staple, because you don't want it to blow out the back. Um, that wasn't the issue on mine. For mine, I was moving the staple further outside of the edge of where it was allowed to staple, so that's why you might see blowouts there. But sometimes, excuse me, you'll see a blowout if the staple is too long, if it's too long for the material that it goes in. But when you're putting in lots of layers of materials, you want the staple to be long enough to bite into the wood through all of those layers of materials. I agree, you're very clear in your instructions. Thank you so much. Would we be better to use short staples because we don't have too much experience? No, so short staples are only used for areas of the project where you need a short staple. A short staple is not going to hold down batting and foam and fabric all at the same time. It won't bite into the wood. So short staples are used maybe when you only have like one layer of material like this or if the wood that you're stapling into is so thin that a longer staple would blow out the other side. So even when you're even when you're just starting with a little bit of experience, you still want to use the appropriately length staples. I have three length staples. I have a 3 16 inch five eighths and a quarter inch staple. And that's, those are, I usually use a half inch for everything unless I need a shorter staple uh, for blowouts or things of that nature. But a half inch is pretty standard for everything that I do. So this is the pattern we just cut out for the seat and we're gonna cut a one inch foam pattern for this. And I have some of that here. trouble of all these giant pieces of foam are storing properly and then accessing it properly. Yes. Also, you should clear off your space so you have a clean surface to work from, which means the floor around you looks insane. That's okay though, you can clean that up later. So this is 
a one inch medium uh, foam. Most, so the foam that I carry on my website is no frills. It's only one grade of foam. It's a mid grade foam and it's all high density and it all has different firmnesses. This is a high density, mid grade, medium firm foam, which means it's not too soft and it's not too firm, it's medium. I use medium on almost everything that I do. I might use soft on the back of a seat or on the arm, something that you're not sitting on, but I wouldn't typically use soft on a seat because it will wear away faster. It'll, it'll age much faster. So I'm using a one inch medium foam, medium firm foam for this back of the seat. And this I can cut out with scissors. I don't need to go crazy. So I'm just gonna place the template. Here. Spread this out because it's fabric. And it changes shape. And I wanna make sure that that shape is straight. So making sure it's flat. And then I'm simply just gonna trace around all the edges. And when I cut it, I'm actually going to go to this inside edge because I went to the outside edge when I cut my pattern out and I don't want this to keep getting bigger. I need it to still fit inside that. So I'm going to cut it on the inside edge. I'm going to use sharp scissors for this that are like fabric scissors. Uh, I would use crappy scissors on this if there was glue on it because I don't want to mess up my good sharp scissors so there's no glue on it let me cut this free first so one inch foam is easy enough to cut with scissors it gets harder with two inch foam so it's not a bad idea to have a serrated knife a bread knife or an electric bread knife to get the job done but it's a little overkill for something like this because this just cuts so easily with scissors. Pretty close. Let's go do the fit and see if it works. Okay, close. Let's see a question. Would be better use short sleeve. Okay. Do you reuse the templates normally or make new one for each chair? Uh, I would probably use this template for all four of these chairs because I have four that are exactly the same, but it's not going to work everywhere else. All right. So now we do the fit, making sure this fits inside the Showwood edge. Because the next layer to go on this is going to be batting, and then the next layer to go on this is going to be fabric. So I need it to fit inside the show edge. So that looks good. Uh, I need to put a piece of material on the outside of this to help strengthen it. And I can't put jute webbing because it's too thick for here. So I'm going to use a piece of heavy duty um, synthetic burlap, which is going to work like jute, which is going to give this a little bit of structure. And that's just going to get a few staples around this area to make it nice and sturdy. Let me cut a piece of that off.
Okay. I'm gonna do a no-no and I'm just gonna cut off enough, eyeball it to make sure uh, I have enough. But you should always measure and then cut so you don't waste material. Because if this isn't big enough, it's gonna be a waste. Very close. Very close. Okay, let's line it up down here. Cut off this top. Now this is gonna get a bunch of staples too. Not as many as the one that was underneath here because it's gonna get more staples on top, but it does need to get locked into place and that needs to happen in the same way. It can go this way or this way. I'm gonna do it this way because I have to glue foam to it and this sticky side will be, it's gonna hold foam better. So I have to staple this the same way as I did the piece of material underneath, which is center here, center here, center here, center here, corner, 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 and then in the centers of those. And that will be enough to staple this for me. Remember to keep your staples away from the show edge, about the thickness of your staple gun away so that you can lay your trim in there nice and flat. So I'm going to do one in the center up top, stretch down. If I don't stretch directly down to the center and I go to the side, you can see the material start to bubble up and shift, and I don't want that. So center, center, and then center here to the side where I'm going to start to pull that out straight. And the same thing here. I can grab my hands and sort of pull this nice and taut. And then corner, corner. And corner, corner this way. So this is providing some structural support for the back of my chair so that if you put your hand on it, you're not going to put your hand through it. Typically, I might do a couple rows of jute webbing before this, but there's not enough material to staple all of that into. So I'm just using this really stiff plastic synthetic burlap as, a, as that barrier and as well as the strength of the back of this. So that's all starting to get stretched out. And now I can go in the centers of these and staple it down there. Maybe drop a couple. You can see I'm starting to really stretch this out there. Be careful not to blow through the back of your chair. I think this one is through the back of my chair. These really thin edges on the bottom here are giving me a hard time. This show edge wood also makes it really difficult to remove staples. So, best to get a hang of how to put those in. Now here my staples don't have to be end for end, they've got to be kind of close together. back through and do this side straight across. And then finish up on the top here. And then I can come back through with my razor blade and remove all the excess material. So I know I'm going to need a sharper blade for this, and my blade might even go duller, faster with this material. But I'm going to cut it the same way I did the others, which is just to push this knife right alongside that show wood and use that as my guide to cut it off. And 
use my glasses as my guide to see what the hell I'm doing. Now I have a surface I can spray my glue to. You don't want to spray your glue directly on your fabric because it can ruin your fabric. Don't assume you can put spray glue on your fabric because unless it's vinyl or leather, you probably can't. I almost cut that all the way through the fabric. I cut it a little bit short and it almost cut through the fabric on the back, which would have meant removing all of the staples we put in today and replacing that fabric, which I have to order more yards of because I only have just enough and it's 60 bucks a yard. Not ideal. And that's because this was not stapled down. I am actually a little bit shocked that my blade didn't go dull fast. So you also don't want any of these little black stringies sticking out either. So if there is material sticking out, we're gonna to wanna to trim that off and remove it before you put the next layer on. Okay, so next step is to glue this bit down. So first, I want to make sure that I kind of have it round about where I need it because I'm nervous about gluing it on crooked because it is cut to the shape of the seat. So I want to make sure it goes on straight. As we said before, contact adhesive only sticks to itself. So I got to spray the surface that it's sticking to as well as the surface of the foam. So I can see it come out. And this way, I do want to kind of get closer to the edges. So it stays. And then I'm going to do the same thing to the foam. Now it needs to be dry and tacky before you touch it to itself. It can't be wet. It will not stick to itself if it's wet. Okay. So now I kind of need to find one side and get it roundabout lined up. And then I'm slowly pushing this down to the bottom. To make it go straight there. So that's good. That's as clean as I can get it. The next step is to put on batting. And the batting I'm also going to glue on and not stick down because of the experience I had at the last one with the blowouts. So we're going to cut a piece of batting big enough to go on top of here. And then we're going to glue the batting on top of the foam and we're going to trim it to just about this line so that it doesn't come out. It just stays at the top of the foam here because when I go to staple the fabric, I'm bringing all of this down with it. So the batting just needs to go on the surface of the foam. I'm going to go cut a piece of that and bring it back to me. Let me make sure this fits perfect. This is just from a little scrap that I had over there. So I'm gonna spray the surface of the foam and I'm gonna spray the surface of the batting and I'm gonna stick them together and trim it. Harder to see white on white, but I'm trying to keep it away from the wood. I've sprayed it to the foam and I sprayed it to the batting. And then I can actually 
because it curves in the center, I want to drop it on the center first and then spread it out. Now, because I have glue all over the back of this batting, I don't want to use my fabric scissors to cut this. I'm going to use scissors that I use with glue all the time. And you can usually tell because there's usually glue stuck all over them. But I'm just going to run this through the very edge of the foam and trim this to the edge of the foam. I'm not stapling it down because I can't put that many staples. I learned my lesson the first time. So I'm saving that last layer of staples for the final fabric layer that goes on top of this. But all of this material will be pushed down with that fabric layer and stapled at the same time. I'm just running my scissors along the edge of the foam so that I can get it right up to that edge. all trimmed up. So that looks nice and cute and fluffy. And the next step is to put fabric on it. What time we got? 147. I think we can get through that fabric layer, but we won't get to the batting layer today. So I'm going to get this set up because I have to iron what I have to make it look nice and clean. And I'm going to read any questions you might have real quick. What is the inches for the back of the chair? What do you mean by that? The inches. You mean the thickness of the foam? Uh, the thickness of the foam on the back of the chair is just one inch thick. I'm dying to repulse from my chairs. I was needing this, so thank you. I'm so glad that you joined me because this is what we're working on today. And we're using velvet, which is a finicky fabric, so you'll learn a little bit about that. The type of batting, the type of batting that I'm using on this chair is polyester batting or poly batting. You can get that at Joanne Fabrics. They have it on the roll or they have it in the bags. If you do get it at Joanne Fabrics, you're looking, the batting needs to be at least half inch thick. The batting I use is three quarter inch thick. At Joanne's, they don't have the thickness listed. You can feel it when it's on the roll so you can see it but when it's in a bag you're looking for high pile uh high pile poly batting okay great i'm going to now bring the velvet piece over for the front so i found this velvet flat fold at joanne fabrics for five bucks a yard they only had two yards of this green, and somehow, through magic, I was able to cut enough to get four chairs out of two yards of fabric, but just for the, um, hold on, I'm tightening this up, just for the seats in front, that got me through. I am putting my iron. Now, typically, you cannot iron velvet. That is, if you've got wrinkles in your velvet, it's permanent. Sorry about it. Uh, but this is polyester high-performance velvet, and it is able to be ironed, to my surprise. So that was pretty exciting for me because I had a lot of this, and now I found it in so many different colors at Joint Fabrics that I am just scooping up every color because velvet is my favorite thing to upholster with. Not the easiest thing, but my favorite thing. Um, so I just try and grab it in every color that I can. So as this heats up, I'll sort of explain a little bit about velvet. If you're using velvet, there's a few things you need to know. On the pros and cons list of velvet, pro, it looks good and it feels good. Con, if you scratch it, it's permanent. If you wrinkle it, it's permanent. If you stand it on the end, it will wrinkle it and it's permanent. It damages very easily, particularly if it's a high traffic chair. 
and people are going to be sitting on it. I hear that cats don't like velvet, so they won't scratch it. That has not been my experience. My asshole cats will scratch anything you put in front of them. They don't care. But that's, that's what I hear. High performance velvet is a little different because you can scratch it and stuff and it doesn't get ruined. But I, rem I know you remember when we were kids on the carpet or on velvet and you could wipe it back and forth and it would change color and we like to draw pictures in it. Well, that is the nap of the velvet changing direction. So when you're putting velvet together, you want all of your nap to go in the same direction from your top part to your bottom part. And that nap has to wipe down from the top down. Because when you sit in a seat, you sit down like this, you're wiping the back of the chair. And when you get out of the seat, you scooch forward. So you're wiping that chair. If you put the nap on in the wrong direction, it's going to mess up the fabric. Here we go. This is messing it up. This is wiping it down. So if you put it on the wrong direction, you're going to continue to mess it up like this. It's going to mess up the hair of the velvet permanently, and it's going to look really bad very quickly. So you want to make sure it's all going in the right direction. You'll also be able to tell if it's going the right direction by putting two pieces together. These are both the same color velvet, but they are facing two different directions. So when you get them in the right direction, this is wiping it down, this is wiping it down, or messing it up. This is cleaning it up, messing it up, messing it up, cleaning it up. Then they look like the same color. But if you flip this around in the opposite direction, it looks like two different colors. Now every time you see an advertised piece of velvet furniture and you see two different colors, you'll know that they put that fabric on in the wrong direction. And it's on every single picture that I've seen. So this is the fabric that we're using. This one I can put away because we use that as our example. You do, for the sake of your mental health, want to mark the top and the bottom so that you know how to put them on. So when I do this, it wipes the fabric down, which means it's brushing it, it's brushing it down. I want that to be the top. So I'm gonna put a T right here to mark the top of my fabric. You might also want to write what panel that is. So this is the top of my seat back front. So I might put top seat back front on this so that I, if I'm cutting all my patterns at once and stacking them, I know just what to do with that. So I am going to now iron this. I'm going to flip it over. You always want to flip your fabric over before you iron it. Most of the time you can't iron velvet, so don't get excited about this process. This is a fluke. Uh, I'm going to use a barrier fabric in between my iron and my fabric, just so I don't melt anything. And always test your fabric before you get going on it to see if you can iron it. And I am gonna use steam, and I'm not even pressing super hard right now, but I also want to make sure I'm going in the direction of the velvet. So this is top, which means this wipes down. So when I iron it, I wanna iron it in the direction of the nap of the velvet so that I don't iron it backwards in the wrong direction. So I'm just starting on one end. Let's take a look before we get too far so we can see those wrinkles. So we got wrinkles in this side that are looking pretty rough. And this fabric is just big enough to put on that chair. I have no excess, there's barely any to cut off. It's just big enough. So with just a little bit of pressure, but not, I'm not putting my weight into it. I'm just sort of from the top down, the top of the nap, down to the bottom of the nap, I'm steaming it. And then I'm gonna take this off and look. I still see some wrinkles in here. So I'm just gonna go back over that. This time I'm gonna try and remove this barrier fabric because I know it doesn't melt it. But if I ruin this in front of you right now, I'll cry. A lot of times, too, uh, ironing your fabric can change the color of it. I can see the color of this back changing right now. On this material, I know that when it dries, it goes back to its other color, but sometimes it doesn't. It stains it, and it makes it permanent. So that barrier fabric was preventing me from getting that little wrinkle out of there, which I see now. It looks like it's almost gone. So just a little bit more work on that to make that smooth. And this time, I might put a little bit more pressure as I'm pushing this down. But 
but I do the whole thing because I want, like just in case it pushes the nap down in a weird way, I want that to be consistent. They do have like felting boards. I don't know what they're called. They're boards with lots of thousands of little pins that stick out of the bottom of them that you can put your velvet on and steam it from the back. And the pins are what go up into the nap of the velvet and prevent it from wrinkling. Nice. So that looks good to me. Now this is ready to use. I'm going to turn my iron off so I don't set my favorite maker space on fire. We're going to remember the top is here. And before we get started, just like we did for the last material, I want to mark the center of the top and the center of the bottom so that I can align that properly because I have very little fabric to work with and I need it to go on perfect uh, or else I'm gonna be screwed. So I mark those centers by notching out the little corner of the fold, which turns that into an arrow for me to mark where the center is. So this is my top. I'm gonna go back to the chair and start to apply this. And then this will be the last stage for today's live. Because I have to go pick up my kids from school. We'll see that this is just like literally just enough to go into those widest spots there. So I have to be really careful. Now, this is the only layer that you're going to staple right up next to that show wood. You don't want to get everything too close to that show wood because you have to lay material on there. Uh, you have to lay your trim on there and it has to look clean. So I left a gap through all these layers so that I could get my um, trim in there. But I have to staple this down and it's going to go right, right next to that show wood. So I'm going to start center top, center bottom, center sides, corner, 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 corner. Just like we did all the layers before this because we need to evenly stretch out this material across the surface of the chair. So... Find my center here, and it is longer on top and bottom than I need it, so that's good. And I'm just gonna push. I have a clear indication at the top where my center is. So I'm gonna put one staple, and you can use a temporary staple at this stage so that you can remove it if you need to. One staple at the top center, and then I have to wipe this fabric down taut, not too tight, till I get to the bottom. And I'm going to use a temporary staple down there because I might have to move it. If I've, if I've moved this in one direction or the other too far, I might end up showing wrinkles on the surface. Or I might see that I don't have enough to cover these sides where it's very, very close. So I want to be very careful uh, and make these staples removable if I can. And then just put it, put my staple, temporary staple, which means instead of going flat, you tip it to the side and it will give you a little bit of a gap to get your staple remover in there if you have to remove it. Now I can tell that I put this on straight because of the symmetry in the folds around where this is stretching. If it wasn't in the middle here and in the middle here, this fold might look bigger on this side than this side. So this looks good. I'm pretty happy with this. Here, I just want to make sure those are in the right spot. So my next table is going to go here in the middle. And then straight across to the center right here. Next step is to get these corners in place. I'm pushing from the center and stretching out the corner to get rid of all of those wrinkles that were in the center. I'm pulling out this way and out this way and kitty corner this way at the same time to stretch out and smooth out that whole area. 
I'll go over that again in the other corner when it's less noisy. But I'm really happy with uh, how much material I've got to come over here. But that makes me nervous about how much material is going to go on the other side. So, corner here. And then I'm going to come down to this corner here. And I'm going to do the same thing. You're going to watch all of this material straighten out. Ooh, that temporary staple wasn't permanent enough. I'm going to replace that first. I use this, like, pushing motion with my hands to get all the excess fabric to, like, push away. And that's like better than stretching in some cases. But if you don't tighten it up enough, this just gets looser over time. So this will just start to get loose and it'll start to look sloppy. So there's a really fine balance between taut and tight. If it's too tight when someone sits on, it's gonna rip away from the staples. It's a feeling, you'll get there once you get started. So now I'm going from the middle out this corner so that I can get rid of these wrinkles here and stretch this out nice and evenly. Again, when I'm doing these staples, I'm pulling it down straight this way, but also kitty corner across. I'm stretching the material out across the surface before I put a million staples in. So I have one, two, three, four, and then corner, 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 corner. Eight staples to get it in place before I go nuts with staples. So this, from this corner, I can stretch the same way. And now you can start to see that I've cleared away all of the wrinkles from that surface. Now you can see that these are sort of puckered in this area, but the rest of our staples should match the tension. So we shouldn't see any puckers here. This should be nice and smooth. If you still have puckers, after you stretch this out and stapled everything, then some of your staples are too tight and you need to take them out and replace them. Looking good. And we got one more corner right here. What we have to do to straighten the rest of that up. And I'm pretty close to the edge here, but it still covers. So it counts. looking good okay so now I'm gonna go in the centers of all these staples and put another staple in before I go around end for end putting staples in this and I like to do it back and forth so that everything goes on evenly hey Josh hey. do you need something as Marty mentioned class I think he's got a class here at 2 30 uh -uh. one person so I'll check to see if he can do it in the other room oh no I can get out of here like oh, two because he's not, he's not back yet so and there's literally just one person signed up for it. So okay. I'll find out. I'll okay. Let you know in the next few Thanks. Thank you. So one of the things I want to keep in mind of is when I put staples through here, I don't want any of these areas to bunch up or wrinkle. So I, if I start to see it, that it buckles there, then I might end up having to remove a staple and replace it. This makes me a little nervous because it might wrinkle in this area. So I'm going to leave that there. I might end up having to take that out to just stretch that out a little bit further. I'm going to come across from here though. Same thing on this side. That's close. That looks good. Now we're going to do one between the centers here. And here I'm kind of just pushing this foam back. I don't want the foam to be uh, under the staple because it'll just sandwich there. It's just being pushed down just inside there and the staple for the fabric is going on the other side of that. That looks good. We'll get one on this side and then one up here, one up here, and two at the bottom. And we should be ready to fill in those gaps. Notice I'm constantly doing this smoothing motion to smooth everything over. That one's looking good. This is the only area that makes me nervous. I'm definitely going to take that out because it's just one staple and why bother cutting it close when it can be perfect? This one 
too. All right. So I'm going to take this one out and this one out so that I can straighten those areas up. I got to be real careful not to damage my wood or fabric at this stage. So my temporary staples are best because they allow you to get your tool under there without causing damage to the wood or fabric. So what I'm checking for is to make sure that this will all go down flat without me having to deal with any wrinkles. And that looks good, way better than before. This one was giving me a little trouble. So I'm gonna fix that. It looks like there's just more material on this side than this side. So I'm gonna take this out. and then sort of like push out so that it spreads out in both directions. And I use my gun a lot to find that show wood edge so that I get everything in the right place. So I think down here is the last little bit of spots that I need. And now I can start stapling end for end, like right up, every staple right next to each other to get around this piece. And then we'll cut it loose and that'll be it for today. And I can still be doing this rubbing thing with the gun to make sure that I'm pushing and smoothing everything down and finding that edge pretty well. The reason why you don't want to start off doing this is because you might end up having to pull stuff in different directions and you don't want to have to go back in a frame like this and remove all those staples that you put in end for end. It's pretty damaging all around. You can see how all of that is going on so smooth. We're just going to work our way all the way around. Probably going to need staples in a minute. I'm using a single welt to cover up this row of staples, which is why they're going straight end for end. If you have the space on your frame, you can do your staples diagonal and you can use a double welt and that'll keep that nice and flat. Looks like I got just the bottom left. Look at her. So pretty. One rogue staple. Oh my God. One rogue staple and about 50 of them that came through the back here. Because I wasn't paying attention and I got cocky. So I have a staple blowout. Let me see if you guys can see this better. 
staples out here, all of these staples here blew out. I can go in and remove them from the front or I can remove them from the back. These ones I can grab from the back. I'm gonna have to go through and finish this, refinish this paint, so I'm not really concerned about scratches right now. Uh, I'm not going through the back. Let's see. So all of these staples, all of these staples here have to get removed. Zero percent of them are temporary. You feel them coming out though. That's good. I'm glad that it's done with this bottom corner where I have a little bit of extra fabric just in case. Try pushing them through. I'm grabbing some of those sharp points and I'm just pushing them through the other side so they stick out. I mean, it makes it easier for me to see which ones are the culprit. This I'm gonna have to sand in here and go back through, maybe even fill some holes if it made. Uh, it took chunks out. That can happen sometimes. It hasn't. I don't think that's a problem. That might be something that you're looking to do. And then some that might be hard to get out. I can come back through and just clip out. That's the only area that happened in though. and see what that looks like looking down so that's Kim from Hello. Hi Welcome um, I know how to do a couple of things. <laughs> oh yeah? Well, you can come and learn how to do it yourself. <laughs> so, well, so I am booked right now, but I have a sponsor student program, and I have a lot of students who have completed projects at a professional level. So you can, if you want something upholstered, you can submit it through that program, and we will do it for the cost of classes that it takes them to complete it and the cost of materials. So, yeah. And there's a QR code on the poster out, back, out front, too. Are you, are you still live or are you? I am still live. <laughs> no, you're fine. I'm live on TikTok. I do Tutorial Tuesdays where I teach everyone live on TikTok. We usually get about 20,000 people come through here. Is it okay? Things over there with Please. Yeah. Like, yeah. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You're fine in the room. What is that over there? Okay. I'll be right with you. Oh, that's no, I was just letting Kim know. Oh, Why he's good? You? Okay, good. Thank you. Oh yeah, wing back. Yes. Let's Nin see. Nineteen twenty eight stickly. Beautiful. Uh I I where where did I say it? Uh, a place that Gorman suggested because it is stickly furniture, so it's high quality yeah. piece of material. Uh my wife has picked out uh, a fabric she wants and the seat cushion 
and the springs are bad. Yeah. It's uncomfortable to sit on. It actually push, like tries to push you out forward. Yeah. It's very uncomfortable. Yeah, we would replace, like redo, replace all of that. And I walk my students through step by step. So they have mm -hmm. me there for the whole entire thing. If you go to, go to um, upholstery.lulco.co, C-O, and I can show you some of my student work on there so you can see how good it is. Upholstery, okay, I got upholstery right low. Dot lulco, L U L L C O. Dot co, C O. L L. L U L L C O. L U L L. L L. C O. Lulco. Dot co. So instead of dot com, it's dot C O. Like that? Yep, that's it. Okay, mm -hmm. go. And then the, here, if you go to sponsor student program, mm -hmm. you can see, uh, you'll see some samples of their work mm -hmm. down this way. But there, and there's also the steps to how to do it, and there's a form on here. Well, I guess mm -hmm. I didn't put the gallery on there. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see, like, on different parts of my website, you can see some of the different types of work that they do. But you just submit your project, which is basically you fill out the form and you attach a photo and you give me some basic measurements. That'll tell me how much materials that I need for it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I will email you and let you know what the cost of classes and materials will be. And you could decide if you want to move forward. And then I bring a student in. And as often as they can come in, I teach classes four days a week. Huh. So as huh. often as they can come in, they will uh -huh. come in during class and they will learn how to do it from there. Okay, so it'll be professional quality. Professional quality, yep. But uh -huh. what I will say is that it's student work. <laughs> it's okay. kind of like going to a dental school. Uh -huh. So uh, it's there might be issues that you see with it that like aren't 100% perfect. Uh -huh. It's student work. Uh, they do do well, though, and I do make them undo and redo things to make it look the way that it's supposed to. So okay. it's still very high quality. Uh -huh. I always just tell people it shouldn't be of high value, monetary value, and it shouldn't be of any sentimental value, just in case. We all know uh -huh. it's a uh -huh. student project. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. my, my grandparents did buy it in 1928. Oh, wow. So yes. for $150. So that sounds It's worth a little more now. A little more now, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but no, uh, you know, I have to, have to take that into account and say, well, if you get it at what half price probably by it's usually two-thirds less about two-thirds less so a chair like that if you went to rendell's upholstery it's going to start at three thousand mm -hmm. dollars and it's going to take about a year for it to get complete because they have a mm -hmm. year-long wait list okay rendell so, is a really good upholsterer rendell's is amazing incredible right. family-owned business they sold mm -hmm. their business actually mm -hmm. to one of their workers who has been working there for 25 years so it's mm -hmm. still in the hands of the people who built that business uh -huh. they're incredible and they're amazing and they have actually employed one of my students uh -huh. so they know that i'm trained i'm constantly training people out here i used to run my own fab shop and it was just my husband and i uh -huh. and we worked for six years seven days a week 15 hours a day and i couldn't hire anybody because yep. nobody knew how to do this yep. so i tried training but training in production is extremely difficult and expensive uh -huh. Um, so we ended up closing our business after six years because we were burnt out and I dedicated my time to teaching as many people to do this as possible. In the 18 months I've been teaching out of here, I've taught more than 300 people. 60% of them continue to come back to continue to work on projects and I probably have about two dozen that are taking on clients. As well. So you say 3,000 have Rendell do it. That would, yeah. be, that would be like the top. Criminal starting at I mean, starting at three thousand, oh, right. and that doesn't include the cost of fabric either. Okay. So that's just for labor right. and materials. And then if you if if your student did did it, it would be it's usually about a, th a third of that price. A thousand. Yeah. Dollars. Okay. It'll it, depend. I mean, I need to see the measurements and materials. That's okay. a wing back, and wing back, wing backs right. typically start anywhere from like nine seventy five on up, okay. depending. So, um, okay. and that doesn't include the cost of fabric. But you say you have fabric. Uh, my wife ha has a has a, a picture of a fabric she like. Oh. So yeah, so that's the original catalog listing oh, cool. for it. Yeah. So my grandmother. Uh, uh, Let me show had, this guy's because they're watching. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. They're here. They just had, here and hang yeah. out. Ha ha has like had an entire file of all the furniture in the house. Wow. So okay, wow, um, she just kept so track cool. of well, this is such and such, you know. So I know that's uh, chair number five hundred one four. 
out of their catalog in 1928. I need to do that. I have a storage so. unit full, <laughs> full of all my favorite furniture. <laughs> I hate to think of what an What's your name? I Dave. Dave, I'm Kim. Nice to meet really you, Really nice to meet you, too. Go to my website, and you can even fill out. So I take clients, but I only take them one at a time. And okay. I currently have a client. Right. I don't have a wait list because I don't right. like disappointing people. Sure. So you can even fill out an estimate form. Right. And when I have an opening, I just send an email out to everybody on that list. And the first person to give me a deposit, which is half down of their right. estimate, is the first person to get that spot. Right. So you could fill out the sponsor student one, or you could fill out a regular estimate one. Right. And when I can get around... I'll send out a thing, and then you'll know when I'm available. Okay, great. great. Thank you very much. It was so nice to meet you. Thanks for hanging out with that, guys. Let's see. We just have left to cut the material free on this piece. Everything is on nice and smooth. I don't see any dimples. There. This one is a little bit of a dimple, but I think once I release this, it's going to release. So I don't want to remove any staples anymore. I need a nice sharp blade before I start cutting this. I'm going to take this one out and replace it. We're on blade number three for this chair, just so you know. Replace it with a brand new sharp one. I use DeWalt blades, the carbide double edge blades. These are the sharpest and they last the longest. So I am just going to run my blade right along the show edge of that wood to cut my fabric loose. And this should not pull away. If your fabric is pulling away from the staples at this stage, then you've done something horribly wrong. But it's also important why to put those staples edge for edge, like end for end, so that it is holding down with pressure on all sides. So this is already starting to look so super clean. You can't see any batting or foam sticking out of here. Everything goes tight into that wood edge and there's a little bit of a gap that I can fit my single welt trim in. If I want a double welt, I might put these staples at a diagonal so that they hold down a nice flat spot about as wide as my finger. I see lots of likes coming through. We're at 79,000. I'm gonna be done here at three. So if you guys uh, will tap the like button or tap the screen as much as possible, I would love to get 100,000 likes before I leave here. And we're already at 79,000, that's not that much. If you're here and you're learning something for free, all I ask is that you tap that like button because that helps drive traffic to not just TikTok, but all of my social media platforms, which is how people find me and learn that I teach classes that they can come to and learn how to do upholstery. That's how I run my business. You guys are a very integral part into help spreading the word. Word of mouth is one thing, but when you can spread word of mouth all over the world, it's even better because I don't just teach in-person classes. I teach live virtual upholstery classes, which means you're in a class live with me via Zoom working on your projects specifically, answering your specific questions and telling you exactly everything you need to do and move in order to complete your project. And when you guys, oh, geez, when you guys are here liking this content, that is helping to spread the word and that helps me sell classes. You'll notice I'm doing small cuts like this because I'm very nervous about doing this and then just like sliding off. I think that I might be. I don't want to slash my material. I'm very scared. This stage is very scary. Not using any type of force whatsoever.
Ta-da! It's looking great. And so the next step to this chair is putting on the seat. Well, we don't have time for that today. Let's take a look see. I don't want to get both the chairs together so we can see them. That looks so good. Look what we did today. I thought maybe it looked a little beefier than the other one, but it really doesn't. I'm just going to take these to sleep off. And even still, it looks like two different colors of velvet because they're next to each other. So I do see I have a little bit of a dimple here. I'm going to take out the staple that's causing that problem. So the back can loosen back up. I still need a staple there. I just need it to not dimple in. So I can go back through and re-staple by smoothing it out. doing this so you guys can see. Alright, that looks better. Is it better on screen? No. Alright. So that's done. The next step is to sew the double welt so that it can get glued around the edge. But we do not have time for that today because I gotta go get my children from school. So let's see what we got in terms of Questions. Did you decide on the fabric choice based on what you could find? I decided on the fabric choice based of the design that I put in my brain. So I am a furniture designer uh, and I do reupholstery and restoration. These are my own designs of a dining room set that I'm putting together. So it's a peony themed. It's a peony slash peacock themed dining room set uh, that I'm actually we're going to be naming after my mother. It's gonna be called Ruby Diane. My mother died a couple of years ago and she loved peonies and peacocks. So this is sort of an ode to her. I will be selling it uh, because I need to pay bills, but this just, when I started to put the image together in my head, it reminded me of my mom. So that's, that's what we're trying to accomplish. I always try to get my furniture and materials at the lowest price that I can get, but like good quality, so that I can get more profit in the end. All six of these chairs, when they're all said and done, there's two captain's chairs, which are bigger, fully upholstered chairs, four of these small dining chairs. I got those for 40 bucks. The material that I got to put on it, the foam, cost just a little over $100, and the fabric, uh, this green fabric was five bucks a yard, and I only got two yards for the fronts of all four of these chairs. The blue fabric that I got for the other chairs is five bucks a yard, and I had to get four yards of that. But this fabric here is 60 some odd dollars a yard, plus cost of shipping and tax to be custom printed. So I spent a lot of money on that, and I got six yards of that material. So that cost the most amount of money was that custom fabric. But I have this place near me called Discount Fabric Outlet. All of their fabric is $7.99 a yard. It's discontinued designer fabrics and it's high quality upholstery fabric. I love to use that when I can and I always send my students there so that they're not spending too much money. I see we still got likes coming in. We're 87.5 thousand likes. I would love to get to 100 thousand likes before we get off here today. So if you're here and you're learning, asking questions, or you're just like hanging out with me and you want to see me succeed in life as an upholsterer, all I ask is that you tap on that screen as much as possible. When you tap on the screen, it tosses my content out through the For You page. More people can find me, more people can take my classes. I teach 
impersonal poultry workshops here in Ann Arbor, Michigan at my local makerspace, MakerWorks, four days a week, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. So if you're not local, you can come travel here for the weekend and sign up for a four day workshop. Each class is three hours long for just $225, which is a pretty good deal to work on uh, work on your project for consecutive days. Now, I also have a one weekend only upholstery retreat where you can come out here. It's a five day, four night stay weekend, all of your meals included, all chef prepared. We're staying at a bed and breakfast historical mansion in downtown Ypsilanti. And during the day we work here at the Makerspace and each workday is eight hours long. So it's 24 hours of upholstery fundamentals throughout the course of three days, four full days of vacation and we do uh, uh, field trips to Discount Fabric Outlet and Haberman Fabrics. And at Haberman Fabrics, they have a fabric expert that breaks down all of the different types of upholstery fabrics that you can use. And then during the lunch hours every day of that retreat, we speak with industry guest speakers like Sharon O'Connor from Vintique Upholstery, who also is on the show Money for Nothing in, on the BBC over in the UK. She shares with us her experience as being an upholsterer in the UK as a po someone who is professionally, formally trained through university. They says what we're dealing with here in the United States where our upholstery industry is dying and the tradition is not being handed down properly. So a lot of people that you see becoming upholsterers are learning from the DIY community. So it's a really fun event if you can get into it. It is uh, $2,150 for the entire weekend, but that includes your stay at the mansion, chef prepared meals every single day, guest speakers, uh, all of your foam and materials for your project except for fabric, but you can pick that up at Discount Fabric Outlet while you're here. Um, and then three full eight hour days of upholstery. It's an all inclusive vacation. But if you don't want to spend over $2,000 on a weekend retreat to hang out with me, you can still come out here and take a weekend full of classes, four day weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, for 225 bucks, that's 10 times less. You get a lot less classroom time, but you do get four consecutive days, three hour days each to work on your project. And I'll tell you that having that four consecutive days of hands-on support, goes a long way to getting you through your project. A lot of people can finish their projects in time, but a lot of people also still won't finish. If you can't get out here locally, or you didn't finish your project while you're out here for the weekend, I also offer virtual upholstery classes. These are not pre-recorded classes. These are live with me classes via Zoom. You're working on your project from home, and I'm giving you step-by-step -step instructions on specifically how to complete your project. The class, the class is with uh, up to six other people. So not only will you be learning from your project, but you'll be learning skills from other people's projects as well. And everybody brings something unique. So someone might be tying springs, someone might be doing deep button tufting, someone might be sewing a box cushion. You're going to be learning the skills that everybody else is. And it's a really, really good time. It's a really great way to make friends uh, for, with people that are like-minded uh, DIYers like us. Great class today, so much to digest. Looking forward to utilizing this information. Thanks so much for coming. I'm going to put this live replay on YouTube. These are live raw replays. I don't edit them at all. So you can go in, you can watch all four hours if you want to, or you can like skim through to see what parts I'm working on and watch the parts that are most interesting to you. I bought upholstery material about a year ago. You've given me the confidence to start my project. I'm so glad. And if you are working on it from home and you get stuck and you need support and you can't take one of my classes, I have a group on Facebook called the Loco Upholstery Club. It's a free private group on Facebook where you can post pictures of your projects and ask for help by tagging me. I'm not the only professional in that group. We've got professionals in that group who have been working for 50 years, but it is my group. And it is a very supportive group of people who are aware that most people come through here are coming from the DIY perspective. So you're being welcomed and your confidence is being built and you're getting uplifting support from professionals and DIYers alike. So it's a really great, uh, it's a really great opportunity to learn upholstery for free through other professionals and people going through just like you. Cocoon to Butterfly says, hey, hun, thank you for last night. And that sounds ambiguous, but Cocoon to Butterfly was in my upholstery class last night. So that's what she's talking about. Don't be weird. It was great meeting you last night, too. It was a fun class. 
Sable gum with a longer nose is essential when it's affordable to get in there with foam. Yep, I always suggest to people if you're going to invest in a, a pneumatic stapler, invest in a long nose first. You can use a long nose for everything, but you're gonna. This project required a long nose in the back. If you don't have a long nose on some projects, you're gonna be stuck. You're not gonna be able to move forward. I'm in Grand Rapids, and I'm surprised we do not have a makerspace. I'm surprised too. That's a really creative community. Maybe you should start one. MakerWorks here, the founders of MakerWorks, they wrote a book on how to start and organize makerspaces and they every year they do a boot camp. So you can actually come out here and learn about how to get a makerspace going and organized uh, and like ask questions with the professionals there and they'll help you get started. Judy Lynn says, looks fabulous. Thank you so much. It did turn out beautifully today. I love the green and that theme. Thank you guys so much for joining me. What kind of project do people bring to the weekend retreat? I live in Oklahoma. Uh, you can bring any project you want so long as it fits in a four foot by four foot space because that's how much space you have to work out of. Most people bring like a wing back chair or a chair like this. Wing back chairs are great first pieces to start on because they're timeless. You can modernize them easily, but they also include just about every upholstery fundamental inside them. So if you do a wingback chair, you can typically translate everything you learn on a wingback chair to just about any other piece of furniture. You can do deep button tufting on a wingback chair, channel back tufting, welting, decorative nail heads. Uh, all of the cuts on a wingback chair are the same cuts that we made on this chair right here. So I, I will say a wingback chair is the best first project to start with, though it might take you longer, only because you're going to take the skills you learn from that chair and apply it to everything else you do. When is your next five day retreat? So my next five day retreat is August 15th through 19th and that's already listed on my website and seats have already begun to sell. There's only eight spots. So you're going to want to get in on that immediately to secure your spot. Those typically go very fast. All three of my upholstery retreats were sold. Well, two of them were sold out. The last one we had four people there, but it was during the school year. And I think that that is what ended up making it so that it didn't sell out. So we're only doing these on summer vacations from now on. Um, so you'll want to get that ticket fast. What I will say is you can finance that through my website. They shop pay or after pay or whatever financing options that they have on the internet these days. You can apply that to your upholstery retreat so you can make payments over time and secure your spot right away. Don says, thanks. Thank you. We're at 96.5 thousand and we have 38 people here in the group that I can see so far. I want to get to 100 thousand before we end here today. So if you're here and you're learning, you're asking questions or you're sharing this, tap the screen as much as possible. Let's get that up to 100 thousand likes before I get off here today because that is sort of like a barrier threshold that we've been having to cross every single live to break that uh, for you page barrier to get my content out there. So when you guys are in here and you're tapping on the screen, you're single handedly helping me save the upholstery industry. And I'm not being like cute when I say that. Uh, when people find me, I'm like one of like a dozen people in the United States that teach upholstery. There is no formal education for upholstery in the United States anymore. So when you are engaging in my content here, people can find me and they find out I'll teach classes. I have had people travel here from more than 20 different states to come learn upholstery from me. I've taught more than 300 people in the last 18 months and 60% of them come back to continue to learn more. I'm not going to brag, but I am a good teacher and I'm a good teacher because I love it. I love doing this and I want to see you succeed at doing this. I could have used a few extra hands in my shop before I closed my business, but I didn't have anybody to hire because nobody knew how to do this. And I couldn't train while well in production because it was just too expensive to do. It cost me extra time, cost me extra money, and then I have people hanging around the shop not really sure what to do, which ended up backing up my projects. So I wasn't able to train in production. So after we closed our business, I focus on training as much as I can for the last 18 months. I've been training people like crazy. We've had people placed in professional upholstery jobs. We've had clients start their own business, like Up and Up Upholstery just opened her first brick and mortar last week or on March 1st. Uh, and so she's taking on clients and she's doing well. Looks like we got to 100,000, thank you guys. But if this is something that you want to learn to do, whether it be for your own personal reasons, to make cool furniture, or if you're already painting or flipping or, or reselling furniture, having this skill is going to give you like 
infinite possibilities of making money because it's in such high demand, but we have a very, very low supply of professional tradespeople in this area. So I'm happy to teach you for free here on Tuesdays when I'm doing tutorial Tuesdays on TikTok, or you can join my local upholstery club group on Facebook for free and you can learn in there for free. You can take one of my in-person classes. I teach four days a week here at my local makerspace on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. You can come to my upholstery summer camp, which is a weekend upholstery retreat. It's five nights or five nights, four days, all meals included. Uh, all of your upholstery materials included except for your fabric and we do field trips so there's special guest speakers or you can learn online from me. I don't do pre-recorded tutorials. My virtual upholstery classes are with me through Zoom working with you specifically on your project answering the questions that you need answers. Love of Peach says she knows her stuff. I would 100% recommend her class. Thank you so much. If you're a student uh, who has taken a class for me and you have anything good to say about it, please leave it in the comments. If you have any bad thing to say about it, please leave it in the comments because I'd love to learn from them. Went and looked to the closest makerspace to me is an hour and a half away. Most of my students, because we've burned through the locals already in the past couple of years, most of my students travel from more than an hour away to come take classes regularly. I have regulars who come every single week. So it is worth it to travel out there, maybe not to do it every single day, but to go work on a project like through for a day. If I had this space before, if I had this space to look forward to before I started my brick and mortar business, I may have never started a brick and mortar. They have all the tools that I couldn't afford to buy. They have 14,000 square foot of space that I can just sort of camp out in one day, reserve a spot. Um, and it's it saves me so much money and so much time. Plus, I run into people who make stuff just like me all the time. It's a really great community. I really love to hang out here. How do you start a makerspace? That's a good question. I don't own this one. I'm just a member here. Uh, but they do teach a boot camp here on how to start makerspaces and how to keep them organized. A makerspace is more of an idea than anything. It can be anything you want. It's just a space where people can go and share the space and share the tools and share the knowledge and learn how to make things. This particular makerspace is open to the general public, but a lot of businesses run their businesses out of here. So they can either lease space so they have their own office space to run their business out of, or they just pay a monthly fee for access to the tools. That's what I do. I pay a monthly fee for access to the tools and space. I reserve this room out when I need it. And I do pay a little extra for storage to keep my tools here because I am here so much and I teach classes here. So they let me do that. Hey, it's Faye from a couple of years ago. I finally finished my dining room chairs, Pringle shape. Fantastic. Good job, Faye. I love to hear that. I'm glad that you're finishing your projects. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming and joining me here. I, my phone's at 9%, so this is going to cut off. So now is a good time to cut this off. You guys got me over 100,000 likes. So that's been consistent for five weeks in a row. Thank you so much. I really enjoy doing this. You can usually catch me here every Tuesday. Sometimes I have to take an admin day, but I'll usually let you know. If you're not in the local upholstery club on Facebook yet, go ahead and join that. The link is in my bio. If you have any questions, you can post them in there, tag me, and I'm happy to answer them for you. I had a really good time teaching you guys today. The chair turned out great. We just have left to put the seat fabric and the welt on. I'll show you guys what the back looks like. Cute. So all of that turned out really good today. And I really enjoyed hanging out with you guys and for all your questions and your help. I will see you again next Tuesday, but I also have class on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So if you're coming to class, then I'll see you there. And then my virtual upholstery workshops are on Saturday afternoons and Monday evenings. So if you have time during that, it's Eastern Standard Time. Keep that in mind. Monday evenings are 6 to 9 Eastern Standard Time, and Saturday afternoons are 2 to 5 Eastern Standard Time. So if you want to learn upholstery, there's a bajillion ways to learn from me. You can learn for free. There's lots of tutorials on the internet. All I ask is that you keep up with it, keep practicing practice 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 because there's a very low supply of skilled trades people and we'd love to get you trained so that you can start making money doing it too thanks you guys so much i'm going to sign off for the day we'll see you later